now recording. All right. Welcome everyone to the Environmental Protection Committee meeting today, December 7th. I'm Alice Blank, chair of the committee, and Wendy is with us here. Where are you? <laughs> um, Chapman and Diana Sweetai from the office, director of planning. So thanks all for coming. We have a pretty profound agenda here. Um, I should quickly point out that um, the applications for 250 Water Street, Governor's Island, both will be reviewed again. This is, we've offered up this time to have conversations, questions that you'd like to ask the applicants on these applications in terms of their environmental impact statements and on issues dealing with environmental protection concerns, hence why it's in this committee. There will be additional meetings, as I think most of you are aware of, um, in terms of the uh, Governor's Island. The comments and the resolution for this community board will be written at the landmarks, excuse me, the land, the zoning, land use and zoning committee on December 14th next week. And at which point we may add in comments on the EIS, or we may have time for a separate meeting, I think, in January for those issues. So that's Governor's Island. So today we'd love to hear and have discussion questions, just have more time to talk about what concerns and thoughts the public have in terms of environmental, the environmental impact statement. On 250 Water Street, the uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, Committee meeting, excuse me, so the community board meeting on that application has been postponed because that was happening this Thursday, which happens to be the first night of Hanukkah. So that will now happen on December 21st. So just want to make everyone aware of that. And um, again, here the we're looking at the draft scope for the environmental impact statement. So this is a time to opine on things that you'd like to have included in the draft scope of work. And we can start with that. Um, and I open this up to the committee members first. I'll just quickly read what, it, just in case everyone wonders what the draft scope of work is. Um, so this is for the environmental assessment statement, which is subject to environmental review in accordance with the city's uh, environmental quality review guidelines. And an ES, EIS was completed. So the environmental assessment state was completed on November 16th. And it analyzes the proposed actions potential to generate significant adverse environmental impacts. So this is something that's been sent around and that is available online, and we were happy to post this again. And a positive declaration issued on November 16th established that the proposed actions may indeed have a significant adverse imp impact on the environment, thus warranting the, pre the preparation of an EIS, which is pretty standard protocol. So the environmental impact statement. So the public interested agencies, cannot. Manhattan Community District 1 and elected officials are invited to comment on the draft scope, either in writing or orally at a public scoping meeting to be held on December 17th at 2 p.m. I don't have the address here. Um, actually, yes, it's, uh, uh, we'll send around the, the, the meeting site, but it's a New York City government site. I'm sorry, that hasn't been provided to us here. So um, tonight, it's a time to describe what you'd like to add, if anything, to the draft scope. And so without further ado, I'm going to open it up to the committee if there's issues and things that you'd like to have considered. Um, Diana will be taking notes and uh, questions will be fielded to um, Howard Hughes and DCP on these issues. So. Anybody have anything that they'd like to ask or have considered? Wow, that's quite extraordinary. Um, I see Michael's hand up. So I will, yeah, I, I, you're good with that, Diana. I, I'll, okay, so I'll handle those questions. So, Michael, go ahead. 
Okay. Um, some of the areas that we want them to study more closely are about shadows, uh, specifically the Pearl Street playground, uh, the tree canopies along Pearl Street, uh, at Delury Square Park, the Peck Slip School roof playground, how it impacts the Blue School, and the Seaport District, the impact on residents in nearby low-lying low buildings. Uh, the historic and cultural resources, uh, we are concerned about the massive construction on the fragile historic buildings immediately abutting the site and beyond. Uh, for urban design and visual resources, we feel that it confuses the historic district ident identity that you, as you enter the district, you would never know that you're entering the district when you have uh, views within the district that are dominated by the tower. Uh, natural resources, of course, we're concerned about the water table and the redirection of water to surrounding properties and above ground about direct sunlight and overall light. Water and sewer infrastructure, we're certainly concerned about the CSO being over capacity already at Newtown Creek. Uh, and the cumulative impact on inf infrastructure resources and city services with proposed towers and then also whatever is going to happen at two bridges. Um, the noise is a significant impact. We think that the pile driving for some reason is not uh, a good thing for school kids and uh, it's going to be needed to support a huge tower. We're very concerned about the carbon footprint that uh, this development will create. And then finally, we're, we're very concerned about the effect of the five-year construction timeline on the adjacent schools and on the, the residents who are at the moment trapped in their homes. So those are our preliminary uh, uh, improvements to the DEIS. That's really helpful, Michael. Is this on behalf of the Seaport Coalition that you're stating this, or the, the you say we? Is that the um, Seaport Coalition has these concerns? Yes, but they reserve the right to have more concerns. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've got that. Okay, this is really helpful. Thanks. Those are um, clearly important concerns. David Sheldon, I see a little pinky being raised. Yep. Thanks, Michael. David, you're on if you can, but you're, we're, we're, you're muted. David, you're muted. Um, David, I will unmute you. Go ahead, All David. Right. Looking at uh, the, the uh, preliminary documents, we noticed, uh, I noticed, and, and collectively we noticed, a number of streets are mentioned in the documents, um, and yet it's not clear at all what is proposed for them and why they need to be included. Uh, I'd like that clarified. I mean, they have a grid that runs from basically the river all the way up uh, to Pearl Street. Okay. Anything else? Good. Okay. Okay, David, thanks. Um, Susan Cole, I see your hand raised. Susan, are you with us? Susan, I am also going to unmute you. Are you there? Oh, she just, I think we are okay. doing it at the same time. Mine was, uh, was uh, similar to David's. It's all about the traffic pattern and what they're doing and how it's going to work. And with all, I was saying with all the increased traffic, but it's all very vague. It's very unclear. And I, I'd like it, I think it should be clarified. Good. Thanks, Susan. Uh, anybody else? I see. Um, okay, it looks like the committee and board, there's no other questions, no other hands raised. I cannot see the attendees hands 
um, Diana, or if I, oh, yes, I can. have a hand up from a gentleman named Andy Sosin. I think it went up before we started. Um, I think he asked a question, but I can't see she, it. She, she. I'm sorry. Hi, Andy. Uh, are you there? Do you have a question on 250 water or something you'd like to add? Uh, I'm here. I didn't realize that we had the scope. The, the scoping document is still on for the 17th, but they moved the committee meeting to the 21st for the environmental for all of CB1. I, I'm a little confused as to what meeting, uh, what what dates have changed. Diana, do you want to? Sure. Um, when Alice was talking about the changed date, that was for the Community Board 1 Landmarks and Preservation Committee, which was originally on December 10th. Um, the 250 Water Street project is currently at the LPC stage or the Landmarks Preservation Commission stage. We were to vote on that resolution through our Landmarks Committee on December 10th, but due to the conflict with um, conflict with Hanukkah, that's moved to the 21st. So that's the CB1 Landmarks Committee that's been moved. And that December 17th date is the deadline for comments on the draft scope of work for the environmental impact statement. What is the deadline for written statements on the DEIS? I believe it's December 17th. It is in January the 11th or something. January the 11th is what I have for. Um, gosh, one of the other ones. Let me check the document. Oh, no, actually, you're right. Wait a minute. Um, okay, I'll just read it out loud here. Uh, the public interested agencies, either in writing or orally, at a public scoping meeting to be held on December 17th. So that's the public scoping meeting. Comments received during the draft scopes public meeting and written comments received by January 11th will be considered and incorporated as appropriate into the final scope of work. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for joining. That's all that I see right now. Um, Alice for 250. I, I think so. I've got Carrie Shanley. Uh, oh, I'm um, sorry. Yes, I just scrolled down. Okay, Carrie, I am unmuting you right now. Thank you all, and I appreciate the board's time. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, fantastic. So I'm a resident of 117 Beekman Street, which is literally right across the street from. 250 Water Street. My apartment essentially has a full view of 250 Water Street. A um, couple things. One is um, you mentioned that the scope is publicly available information. I've yet to be able to find it, or maybe it's just information that's available to the board because we did have an annual meeting with Howard Hughes Corporation and um, they were unable to provide us with details um, about a month ago um, related to the specifics of their um, their testing, their boring testing. So we actually don't know, I don't know what the actual results do look like, but I will tell you that I have a significant concern because I have um, a husband who has significant medical issues. And without knowing the information as far as what the results are, and there was also a comment, which I'm not gonna hold them to it, that this, there was an expectation that this excavation would start in February. We have no idea from a time, and we have other projects going on within our building structure itself. So we have no idea of what the expected timing is. All of the concerns that Michael had expressed, if you can basically include, our building is literally called Seaport Park Condominium Association. If you can envelop the Seaport Park Condominium Association onto all of the things that were just expressed, especially from the noise and also public health standpoint. I am work from home. My husband has worked from home. I'm going to reiterate this, that this is also the case for, I would say, almost everyone in our building. So there's a significant health risk that starting the excavation now will cause risk. My building is a landmark building. I have no idea what the excavation will do to affect this building, let alone all of the resources that we need as expressed before, water, et cetera. But let's just talk about what the effect is going to be, especially with the expectation that you are taking out enough soil to be able to build 
what they hope to be is a 450-story, two of them, towers to take the full full print. So that's quite significant. And even if you're just drilling down to the foundation, you need a pretty big foundation in order to essentially set the concrete to start building a significant building. We have a significant lack of information here. So there's a concern across the board with my building and the effect that we're going to have, the effect that this is going to have on us from a personal health standpoint. And I've yet to hear any information as to how that's going to be alleviated. I've yet to hear what Howard Hughes is going to do to keep us safe. All I hear is the risk. Thank you, I appreciate everyone's time. Thanks, Carrie. Very, very important points. Thank you. Um, I saw Megan, but your hand is down now. Uh, I see her hand still is up and Megan emailed me. So Megan, I'm going to unmute you now. Megan? My e uh, am I heard now? Yeah, yes. we can. Sorry, Hi, my internet is very weird right now. Um, so I wanted to bring up two points um, speaking for children first in the first regard is that after eight months of our children being trapped outside of our schools and no one on ones with our teachers. Um, this is going to start in the same year that we might have a chance to get back to some normalcy. Our children are significantly behind in their schooling. They are emotionally, socially, completely stressed beyond what any reasonable person would allow if you could help for these young children. These are this pre-K center. We have three-year-olds to 10-year-olds that are in these spaces. Then we're gonna lose our outside space. We're gonna lose our roof deck and all the windows and doors are gonna need to be shut because of the dust and the remediation that's gonna happen. None of this should be starting now, and none of this is being talked about inside this scope. The scope needs to consider the social, emotional, and health of all of the children that this is going to absolutely destroy. That is my ma major point that the scope needs to address. And then my other, I, I don't understand how this scope looked at what Howard Hughes is proposing while simultaneously the city is putting through massive text amendments through the DOB. It will literally change the shape and structure of the entire building going on in the seaport. The entire project that is in front of us should not be considered until all of the new text amendments have been agreed to and it can be incorporated into an actual scope that would look at the environmental impacts. The EPC for the city hasn't even voted on the DOB changes yet. It's absurd that this is before any of us or going in front of CPC. This is a rush job by Howard Hughes to try to slam this thing in in the middle of COVID. And when the mayor de Blasio is looking to get any sort of project started while we are all under such stress. Thank you. Community board one rocks. <laughs> So do you, Megan, one question. Um, are you referring to the, uh, the, when you're talking about the DOB, um, could you specify what you're talking about? Are you talking about the, the Department of City Planning, citywide zoning for coastal flood resiliency? No, um, the, the DOB, the DOB is putting out those new text amendments that we, there was a whole, um, remember like two weeks ago, unless I'm misspeaking around the, no, about the agency. There was, um, they're talking about a citywide text amendment that is going to be implemented for all buildings in high risk flood zones. It is, right. it's going to give new FAR. It's going to allow new height. It's going to allow, sorry, my children are yelling. It's going to allow, <laughs> <laughs> shut up over there. It's going to allow complete new building to be placed after this is being looked at and the scope, then they won't have to go back and get it looked at as long as they're hitting all the bells and whistles that the new DOB standards are including. It's it's the cart before the horse. Right, okay, you're referring to what was presented last month, thanks. Okay, right. And right, Good they're point. going into, a le uh, they want them to go into effect in 2021, right? Like, like four or five months. It, uh, yes, I think that's correct. 
I, mean, I actually can't speak to that specifically, though. I think you're correct. Um, but it's a really good point. I have to look into it. Um, so I, I see a cut and thanks, Megan. I see from Victoria Hillstrom saying she'd like to respond. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, Can Victoria. You is that you? Okay. Hi, it is. Uh, this is Victoria Hillstrom at 385 Greenwich, aka 71 North Moore, uh, our, our, our lofts since 1982. And I'd like to speak uh, to the previous caller that has really substantial concerns. Our lofts across from the Greenwich Hotel, and most people don't know this, uh, suffered damage uh, from adjacent property now on 37 permits. It wasn't just a matter of uh, the Greenwich Hotel going too high. They went down three floors instead of one, failing to surround the sur sur survey the surrounding landmarks. And 385 Greenwich dates back to 1805. 71 North Moor dates back to 1815. Uh, they caused damage to both roofs. Our windows began to break one by one. Uh, we literally caught them falsifying every record uh, with the city. Uh, we worked with Frank Rubes, uh, who many of you I'm certain know uh, from the DOT. And uh, it turns out the damage went down to the support beams in 2006, 16, that finally proved how the damage on the 37 other permits occurred. They also damaged 64 North Moor next door to the hotel, uh, 61 North Moor. Uh, so, you know, these are and I would also like to say, I had walking pneumonia for two years from this construction being so close and our windows were broken. They were rattling. I, I didn't even know that I had walking pneumonia by the time it was over. Our lofts, incidentally, uh, were the centerpiece of the city's $20 million Airbnb scheme. Uh, in response to me filing for loft protection uh, and protected occupancy status. So I, I would like to say, uh, as a designer, uh, I designed the prototype for the Madewell store on Broadway. I designed the liquor store and Ludlow for J. Crew. They were prototypes for the J. Crew men's store. It is completely inappropriate for any of this to be going on without all of us present so that we can't see what people are talking about, number one. Number two, we have a pandemic where 1.4 million New Yorkers stand to lose their home. We have 40% of New Yorkers that earn $100,000 and over hoping to leave New York and 40% of our luxury housing uh, sitting vacant. And so the question is, why is Mayor de Blasio allowing any of this to go through, much less interfering with our historic districts and disrupting the, intextural, the architectural integrity of the seaports, of Tri Tribeca, uh, our lofts, uh, 385 Greenwich, aka 71 Northmore, they literally pulled the plug while LPC was approving. They couldn't see what they were approving. And now these landmarks have been altered. They are the oldest buildings in Tribeca. 385 Greenwich was a hotel for sailors. Uh, the Greenwich Hotel is actually a copy. Uh, Laconque Verdi's door, it literally copies. It was a triple, triple brick building. So I, I, I would just like to say that I don't know who this Howard Hughes Corporation is. Uh, there are 46 buildings in our case with the Gindies, Century 21, who just went bankrupt. There are more accidents and fires where every single business record has been falsified. Buildings are being illegally uh, converted and conveyed. And so that we are very, very foolish to believe that this doesn't just reflect these two towers. In fact, every landlord will, in other words, we're creating pre predatory equity where they go after everyone around them. In our case, our loss had been tied up on the courts for 13 years, a quarter of a million dollars. I keep winning and they keep using the city to circumvent the courts. What I'd like to say to everyone most of all, uh, many of us were at the MIH hearings. That's where I met our wonderful neighbors, friends of the South Street Seaport, Tribeca Trust. We all testified in record numbers against uh, mandatory inclusionary housing along with Harlem. If anyone sat through the city council hearings, Vicki Bean and Alicia Glenn promised us that they would use every tool in their toolbox in order to approve MIH. And what that meant was the, the DOT, the DOB, the DOF, uh, where 
it, it's atrocious what has gone on. I don't know if anybody knows about the 21, the lucky 21 rent stabilized buildings in, in CB1. You might look up those 21 buildings that are being marketed at market rate. My yeah. friend is in two gold. So I have very serious concerns that this is a, a, about anything other than making Howard Hughes rich. And yet, these are, this is a historic district. These are our landmarks that are to be preserved for public enjoyment for hundreds of years to come. And the notion that the mayor is doing this in Soho, in the seaports, uh, in the meatpacking district where, where I am at this moment is absolutely vulgar. And as CPC testified, this wasn't for us. It wasn't for the community. MIH is to attract businesses from other states. And in other words, Google and Amazon and whoever else it is. So that I just think that given half of the mayor's staff has you know, abandoned ship, we don't have Maria Torres Stringer. By the way, my case pushed the loft bill past the Senate and Assembly uh, with Senators Hoyleman Squadron and Debbie Glick. We just passed the loft bill in Bushwick. So that I think that we need to be uh, very clear that it isn't that this is being handled remotely, that every other community group across the city, Gowanus, I Industry City, uh, uh, everyone is objecting to this, absolutely saying this must stop. We want nothing to happen until the pandemic is over. And we wouldn't be alone to suggest such a thing. The other issue is, is that it seems that Mayor de Blasio has taken significant campaign contributions from every single developer that has, you know, an iron in the fire that we need to really, uh, whether it's that we look to Governor Como, I completely stand with my friends at Children's First, with the uh, Save the Seaports, with Seaport Pre Preserve, every single community board in every single tenant group across the city, every single thing that's gone on for 10 years, all anybody says is nobody wants a repeat of Tribeca after 9-11. And it's now happening at the seaports. And whatever is going on, it needs to stop. In most cases, if you look at the city records, in my case specifically, what they claim permits are for is not what the city found, is not what the FDNY found. It, it, it's not what the LMCCC found, that we are introducing a level of fraud to make developers rich. And underneath it, they are forcing its residents out for higher taxes. And I would respectfully submit that this mayor has done nothing for us. The city is in shambles. Our landscape is changing. And this community board needs to stand up, put on their big boy pants, and let the mayor know in no uncertain terms this is not happening until the pandemic is over. And if that's how we run out the clock until we have a mayor that addresses everyone's concerns, we have buildings being warehoused every fourth building in Tribeca. I, I don't know what rezoning uh, see anyone. Well, of course, at the time, the idea was that either you were owners or you were renters. And my God, you would make a fortune and be able to move to Florida. Of course, my, my neighbors were removed by hook and by crook with horror stories. So let's be very clear what a company the size of Howard Hughes Corporation and the effects on these seaports. These are our landmarks and historic districts. And I would respectfully submit that if we can't stop it as a community, that we need to file suit because they are violating everyone's rights that can't participate during a pandemic. But, and it's just not right. Victoria, it's a, tre a tremendous um passionate um and eloquent yes well i'm a victim piece. of this so and, I, yeah i, I, I appreciate like the, the, the precautionary uh, tale thank you the people in we are going to have to in these footprints move on are however elderly. i would just like to say and i don't want anybody to suffer what we were made to suffer many of you know us justine almada carlos's daughter was chief of staff for dan garodnik grew up in our lofts Carlos is a very famous restaurateur. Right. We are very well loved in, in Tribeca and we would feel very badly if we didn't privately share with our neighbors what happened to us so that you don't have to go through this well, horror. It, it's, uh, it's very helpful that you've thank made that you. a, on public record. So I, I, I applaud your, your well, doing that. You. And I encourage you, given your perspective, to show up at the oh, I, upcoming I Landmark I'm Preservation well Commission meeting. I Alice, very well thank you very Alice, much. Alice, Jason here. Jason Friedman, Community Board yes, One. Jason. 
Yes. I just I was inspired by this uh, horror story and just wanted to go on record saying, you know, my buildings that I live in right across the street date back to as early as 1789 and they don't even have much of a foundation to them. So, I mean, I'm actually one of these guys that's going to hoot and holler about the, the height of this. I think there's a lot of people to do that. But of course, we can't have people just driving huge piles into the ground and destroying the, you know, the structures right by. And, and these are very, very, uh, let's say, highly susceptible delicate. structures. Exactly. Delicate. So I'm just going to since I'm here, go on record. Carlos is an architect. Really, thanks very much, Jason. That's a really important point as well. Um, are there um, other comments from others that we could add to the? Alice, I'm going to um, Charlene next from the thanks. I Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. So Charlene Balfour. I also live in 117 Beekman, which is the building just adjacent to the 250 Water Street. I wanna raise uh, two points in addition to the points that were raised earlier. One is for additional consideration for the location of the site with respect to the exit strategy for many of the um, financial district uh, businesses that uh, operate downtown. The, the site is about 100 uh, meters uh, away from the Brooklyn Bridge on ramp the FDR on ramps and the on ramp for both FDR North and FDR South. Any obstruction to that, given that we also have the gold reserves for the Federal Reserve Building very close by will in, um, materially inhibit um, the financial markets as well, because you won't have a viable exit location if construction would block any of those very important routes to um, the major throughway for the city. I also wanna note um, the, that um, it not only is the site um, from a transportation perspective a huge um, issue, but should it cause any undue flooding or any de deterioration in the sites, again, you have huge financial sectors that are need that um, throughway of Water Street um, for important exits, not only for the city, for the financial markets as well. So just want to make that noted. Thanks very much. Important points. Diana, do we have anybody else? Yes, we have um, Carrie Shanley that I'm going to next and then um, Stacy Shubb after that. And Hi, Carrie. My apologies. I did have a chance to speak before, but I do have a question because again, I'm, I'm unable to find the report that you are referencing and I've gone onto several websites. What is the time frame for when Howard Hughes is looking to start the major excavation as it currently stands in the report? This is a draft for the scope of work. There is no timeline and there's no excavation. So that is not indicated. We will definitely, Diana, can we post this on the website? We'll post the link, Carrie, and um, you know, get that to you right away so that you can review it. Um, sorry that it's difficult to get to. Um, so thanks. I, and I appreciate we'll that because I know that sure. there were two items on your agenda. Um, one was review the scope of work. Um, is the next item not related to time frame either? Uh, the next item is the zoning for coastal flood resiliency. Is that what you're referring to? Or the earlier item we're waiting for Laura Dodge. Uh, that may be what you're referring to. She it will be, very well be. Yeah, she will be updating us on the Brownfields application and the remedial investigation. So I think that's what you're referring to. And yes, that is hopefully going to happen imminently. <laughs> With an update okay, on so just that, that, that question. Yeah. Yeah. So well, it'll happen. Unfortunately, Laura Dodge, um, our consultant, is late, uh, which so we're, she promises to get here. So we're hanging in there. So we're just moving forward on the agenda until she shows up. Thanks, Carrie. So I see Charlene. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank oh, you. pleasure. Yeah. Charlene Balfour, is that who's next? I see. We just went to Charlene. Um, I'm actually going to try to clear these because we've gotten through all okay. these. I'll I'm going to let me find Stacy, who I know uh, wanted to speak as well. Hi, Stacy. <clears throat> Stacy, are you there? 
All right, I've unmuted Stacy. Oh. Hi, am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Yes. Thank you okay, for great. Thank you. Um, so my name is Stacy Shub. I live um, directly across the street from 250 Water at 100 Beekman. Uh, during Hurricane uh, Sandy, we were evacuated. Water entered our building and destroyed elevators. The lot that we're talking about was completely submerged during Sandy. I bring this up because we're really not addressing resiliency here. We don't even have a funded plan in place. We have no idea how we're going to be dealing with that. So I don't understand how we can even really be approving plans for something when we don't even have a plan for resiliency. Of course, tall buildings uh, add to uh, rising uh, storm surges. If you go down the block just a few blocks over, we have a, a tall building that is leaning three inches. They have stopped construction on that for months or years. I don't even know how long. Um, and obviously, we wouldn't want to see that um, straight across the street. And a little side note is in looking a little bit at, at um, Howard Hughes Corp, one of the things they're being sued for right now is not adequately stormproofing um, properties that they sold. Thank you. I, I just want to know what the rush is. It, we're in a pandemic right now. We have all of these issues that have not been resolved. Um, a structure like that being built, you can't make changes after. You know, sort of like, you know, measure twice, cut once. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. Good point. Um, Jeff, you're I had my hand up. Can I? Can I go? That's all. Didn't see your hand. Yeah. Oh, I. I thought it was up. Okay. I don't. <laughs> have, uh, it's not going to be too. Uh, concerns that are realistic and will need to be mitigated. A lot of them. I think another point the board should make is that. You know, especially with the city facing dire financial straits for years to come, the cost of additional inspections, like Jason might need in his building, or additional traffic agents for the neighborhood, additional environmental uh, reviews, those things should be borne those expenses by the developer, not by the city. And we should make sure that the mitigation measures are put into place. And it, again, if the city can't pay for them, or maybe they shouldn't even be forced to pay for them, we should suggest that the city be reimbursed by the developer for these costs that should not be borne by them. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Oh, I think that's a really good point. Thanks for bringing that up. This is Wendy. I see David Sheldon's finger up again, Diana. I don't know. If that's... Just a, am I on? Yes, you are. Just a point of clarification. My, uh, my question did not refer to traffic issues. It's the number of unmapped, demapped streets that are included in the uh, original scoping proposal that I'm concerned with because I could not find why they're there, what is proposed for them, but they are clearly outlined in the maps. That's my question. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, anybody else? I see that Data has a, has a hand up. Hi, this is Data. I'm a public member of a different Detta. committee. Hi, Alice. So I just, in the beginning of this discussion, you said that right now is the chance for the community to weigh in on what they would like included in the scope of the environmental review. Correct. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding that that's what we're discussing. Yes, I mean, there's more issues that are being raised here than that, but yes, I think that's the, that would be helpful to cover. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Okay. 
Alice, I have a quick question. Is that Tammy? It is. My board chair. Hey, Tammy. How's it going? You know. Very well. Welcome. Good to hear your voice. Thanks. I, you know, I'm always lurking around. Uh, <laughs> question that I have, and I apologize for being late, uh, but did you go over uh, the environmental impact that may be derived from the additional heights that will be, um, you know, if the zoning for coastal resiliency goes through, then that changes the height and the landscape for shade studies and things like that. So is there a point that in here we can request those to be included? That's a good idea. Megan uh, touched on that idea, and I think that's, yeah, to be more specific on that is a good idea. I would say I do have concerns specifically on that site about the effects that it has on the school next door, uh, the schools, uh, because of the the rooftop play spaces necessitate light to for the kids, so, and being in shadow is not great. Yeah, Timmy, the the uh, light was definitely came up, and also the um, uh, you know putting all of the foundations in, all of the you know pile pile on, piling uh, when that's happening, how it's going to affect you know all the buildings, but especially school children in the building. That also came up in case you didn't hear it. Um, that's cool. And then there's I don't know where this goes, Alice, and I leave this to more of my environmental experts. Uh, um, there has been dialogue and conversation about um, potentially changing traffic patterns around the building based on applications that they may future file. Is there a way to include that initially in their environmental study and review? Because their slides showed Pexlet close, which DOT had ruled that out. If you remember when Pexlip became a school, they said that it was impossible to close Pexlip due to circulation needs. At least DOT came back to us and said that when um, Pexlip school opened, said that it was required to leave that street as a definable street. And in fact, that's also where the school buses drop off. So the question is on their presentation and slides that they've showed the community board, they did show Pexlip closed. So how does that fit into an environmental study? Well, I can, I, what might be helpful is, first of all, I, I think the more specificity that we have and that the community is offering, the better the, you know, EAS, EAS will benefit from, I would argue. Um, all that is written in the technical information portion on transportation currently is the following. The CEQR technical manual, which is the city um, environmental quality review, states that the quantified transportation analyses may be warranted if a proposed action results in 50 or more vehicle trips and or 200 or more transit pedestrian trips during a given peak hour. The proposed actions may exceed the CEQR threshold for analysis in areas of traffic, transit, and pedestrians, a description of the task to be undertaken the transportation section of the EIS is provided in the draft scope of work. So I would say providing more specific, again, specifics that many people are now speaking to, including the one that you've just addressed, should be part of our um, resolution. Thank you. Okay. I know it was touched on a little bit about um, a storm, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, if the site is open, if the, the hole is in the ground, you know, what, what, what would they do about it? Uh, can we, is that specifically addressed or, you know, what, what are, what are we talking about in terms of, uh, you know, obviously there's no overall plan, but uh, even interim measures that they're working on around the site itself. I'm not sure. It, I couldn't answer the, qu the question, so I didn't write the, the scope here, but you're asking that that be 
recognized. But that be included of, that, yeah. you know, if, if we have, um, you know, it, if there's Sandy, that's a really bad situation, but even if there's a, a more minor storm, uh, you know, what flood mitigation measures are they doing to protect that site when it's an open hole? Uh, you know, that that's one that's come up multiple times over the sc scope of several meetings. And of course, you know, everyone's like, well, all of lower Manhattan will be in so much trouble. We'll all be in, in a terrible situation. But I think that we can at least ask that again. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Wendy. Okay. Are we. Hi, Alice. This is Rosa. Actually, I had. Just oh, hi, Rosa. Up. Hi. So I, I'm not seeing anyone. <laughs> I'm going to rely on Diana because I clearly am not seeing the hands well enough. Okay, Rosa, thanks. Sorry. Uh, so I'm sorry because I actually didn't read the document, so I'm just going to wing it. But um, in relation to the schools and the sensitivity of the neighboring properties, um, I guess I have two significant concerns. One is obviously the noise during the period when the site is being remediated, but then also um, the inevitable planned uh, construction. Um, the foundation work for such a large uh, piece of property is going to take a significant amount of time and be incredibly um, noisy and polluting. And then the construction work itself of um, assembling the building until the envelope is able to be closed is going to be incredibly disruptive to the neighboring properties. And I think that as New Yorkers, we, we sort of, I mean, at least I take it for granted that that, that is something that you sort of have to accept as uh, being a New Yorker because, you know, we're all like slammed right up against each other. But in this specific case, because we do have the schools right next door, um, specifically uh, with, you know, young children in them, that is an enormous concern to me, especially for the period of years it will take for this work to be done. And while I um, do accept that, you know, people with private property have the right to develop that property, um, my concern is that the impact here is going to be enormous for the children and um, that must be addressed. Um, and I think that part of the way to do that is to address it in the environmental review process and have a plan for mitigation of both the pollution and the um, noise impact, which is going to be huge. I mean, I can't imagine how children are going to be expected to study and learn while construction is going on right beside them every single day. Um, so I think we do need to, to have a plan that will actually be able to address that and it will go on for years and i don't think that any sane parent would want to send their child to a school where they think that their children will not be able to learn in that environment for years so we're essentially closing the school if we don't have a plan in place to address that rosa basically uh what you're bringing up is what happened to ps234 when the whole foods um when that whole building went up um, and they built a wall around 234 and tried to, you know, soundproof it of sorts. But of course, as you can imagine, it was very dark uh, in the cafeteria and, the, and everything along that wall. And it was still very, very loud. Um, so, it, it, I mean, anyone who was around at that time period, even those of us who had, you know, homes a couple blocks away, during the piling, the whole, you know, blocks shook, but that's, yeah. everyone knows that's normal for when a big high rise is going up. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess what I, what I'm thinking of is, is um, rather than trying to build a box around the school, I'm thinking build a box around the property. Um, but look, it's not ideal in any way, shape or form, but we do have to have a real serious plan to deal with that. Um, so. Yeah, good, very good point, Rosa, to say the least. Yeah, these are really excellent points and really helpful. Um, okay. We did just get an email from Laura Dodge, I should say. Um, which I, so Laura is still tied up. So she is not sure she's going to make it, but 
she's hopeful, but I, I wonder, Diana, well, I guess I can, we can still wait around and then she's typing up notes to provide the update and then I'll read it to everyone. So why don't we, should we wait a little longer or what do you think, Diana? Um, the fact that she provided a written update makes me think that she may not be able to join us for some time. I wanna make sure that the folks who came for this will catch it. So I think you're right. Maybe um, I can read it, or if you want to read it, you can go ahead and read it. But I think we should go ahead and provide the, the update that she has for us now. And, and if folks want to stick around to see if Laura can, can join, they can, of course, do that. Uh, absolutely terrific. Go ahead, Diana. That would be terrific. Thanks very much. So this is up right now. Up. Oh. Okay. So we're not, we're not. Oh, Vera, I'm sorry. Yep. More people from the, okay. So we'll backtrack here a little before you read Laura's statement. So Vera. Yeah, hi. Um, I, um, I wanted to bring attention to the fact that there's St. Margaret's house, which is right across on the west side, across the street, which houses about 250 some seniors. And I really would like that the uh, scope address the impacts that this construction will have on a uh, senior community facility, you know, seniors who are living there, um, what an impact they would have on their health on their lives. As we know, there have been studies done, especially in our borough based jail. Um, uh, when we were, we did studies, there was a, um, say there was a senior center right to where the new jails can be built. And we know that the effects of the dust and the noise could actually be life threatening to um, uh, vulnerable people, such as, um, uh, such as seniors. So I'd really like to know uh, the impacts that this would have and what sort of mitigation could be done. For that um, community, which is living right, which are living right across the street, and many of them are disabled, how are they going to be able to um, navigate around all the construction and the, and the traffic and all that, all of that? Perfect. Yeah, really critical. Thanks, Vera. Right, absolutely. Okay, I see Andrew Zelter. Quickly, Alice, coming back to the point or the, the issue that's been raised repeatedly about schools. When Wendy was mentioning the experience with 234, I'm wondering if there's any value in actually citing specific examples where despite representations and, and extensive efforts to mitigate the issues, they were not effective and we're concerned about a repeat in this instance. So if we can actually cite specific examples. I think it's a great a, a great resource to use examples in history, not repeating itself, as Veer's pointing out with the borough based jails application and this absolutely with PS 234. Yeah, of course. Yeah. In, in addition idea. to 234, the ball fields had uh, hazards from the Goldman Sachs building when glass fell out during construction onto the ball fields with, when kids were out there, um, which actually resulted in essentially boxing in. Goldman Sachs says it was being topped off so that it wouldn't happen again. Um, so we can mention that as a precedent as well. Thanks, that's, Jeff. And Jeff, that's super important considering that Pexlip has an outdoor play space as their primary resource or the streets. So good. That's great. Okay. All right. I I have see a hand from I don't know I think Carrie I think we've already you've already spoken so we've got Roberta did we hear from Roberta Bel Belubovich Roberta yet and I think I cleared these earlier so I think oh okay, I think Carrie's hand went right back down but no we haven't heard from Roberta yet and Roberta muting you now. Hi Roberta are you on? Maybe we circle back to Roberta. I see Megan has a hand back up as well. So I'm going over to Megan now. Hi, sorry guys, really quick that, but the glass thing reminded me, uh, the Geary building had panels of glass fall out mm. and actually left a gouge in the ground where the children would be walking into school. Look, clip was put in there. There was not supposed to be 470 stories above it. It was supposed to be a 12 story building. So I, I just think that there's, it's not what anyone signed up for there um, because of the law. And there was a panel that fell and almost uh, and gouged out the ground underneath the Geary building. Okay. So how, what uh, are the, what are the glass? How is the glass going to be held in? Yeah, that kind of thing. Thanks Megan. 
Okay, I'm gonna go back to Roberta. Roberta, are you on? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, great. Okay, I was just about to type you a message into the chat because I don't know why you couldn't hear me. Um, this this may seem like a very small concern compared to some of the major concerns, but it is a concern for me and possibly for other people. Having gone through this pandemic and been locked into the house, the only thing that kept my mental health was being able to go out onto my terrace and grow things. We will not be able to open windows, go out onto our terraces, and that is also a significant financial impact because we pay for those terraces on a monthly basis along with the apartment because they are considered part of the apartment. And it, it's, I find that to be an incredible hardship. I'm right across the street uh, at 100 Beekman. And so I just wanted to put that on record um, in case that was considered as important as I think it is. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Kate, that's it. Uh, let's see. I'm going back to Carrie Shanley. Yep, just very quickly, since Laura is not presenting, but you're reading a statement from her, does that mean that the public will have another opportunity to actually ask her questions in a public forum? I would say that's yes, she will be coming back certainly and she will be coming to community board 1, which is her forum and. She, and in fact, I would say that questions that you all have for tonight, we can um, feel to her as well. And if I'm not mistaken, we can get back to everyone somehow. Would that not be something we could do Diana? Yeah, of course. Um, I, I mean, it's unfortunate if we can't do it live tonight, but we'll provide the update. Um, that we have, and for folks that have questions, I'm I'm happy to engage with Laura and get back to people um, via email. Or... Rather than doing that, again, my question is: Will we be able to ask her questions in a public forum for all to hear versus this one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, the one-on-one. -on -one, I'm sorry. She will be coming back to community board meeting. Um, to to provide an update, and so at that point, that will be a okay. public meeting. Is that what you're asking? She definitely okay. will come back. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I'm asking. So that's yeah. just basically a meeting to be determined. Because again, from my time frame, since I'm on the fifth floor, and I will have literally um, be directly within the scope of risk once the remediation does start, I need to know a time frame because I may need to escape my building. I yeah. may have no choice from a safety perspective because everything that I'm hearing so far um, really puts a lot of concern with the health of me and my family. It, it, there is no construction that's imminent in any way here. So um, let a day and a one. This seems like a timely moment to read the update so we can see Laura's sense of timing on that. If you'd like, I just want to get to one more. And Charlene Balfour, who um, did not have, could not raise her hand. I just want to get to Charlene quickly okay. and meeting for a bit. Charlene, yes. go ahead. Yeah, so thank you. I was able actually, and Carrie, I'll send you the document online. I was able to look at the document online, and I know over 20,000 square feet of retail space that would likely displace many of the historical bars and restaurants that um, make up the fabric of the seaport. And the longevity of those bars and restaurants, many of which have gone back for centuries and time before the Brooklyn Bridge, will be um, impacted economically by having another 20,000 square feet in retail space, in addition to about 20,000 vacancy in re retail space that currently exists in the seaport now. I also would like um, an, um, on in, within the scope of work for the Howard Hughes Corporation to specify their definition of low income with a specific income range that's associated with that low income number they put in the statement of work. And finally, within the statement of work, it would be really helpful if the Howard Hughes Corporation was very specific on the alternate ways they can um, rebuild space in the seaport to accommodate 
their need for museum space. There is already around 30,000 square feet of museum space that's not in use. So just want to understand the need to add additional museum space um, that's called for in the plan. Thank you. Good points. Okay, I think I, now, Alice, would you like me to read the statement from Laura? That would be swell. Thanks. Okay. This is her statement. On November 23rd, 2020, I received updated figures from New York State Department of Environmental Conservation that were prepared by Langan in response to the agency's request for additional figures and our request for Langan to prepare a cross-sectional view using the soil borings in the vicinity of the former thermometer factory and workshops. We have reviewed the figures and have some comments that we will provide to New York State DEC in the next day or so. I spoke to the DEC project manager, Rafi Alam, relayed back that DEC has reviewed the additional information but is waiting for the New York State Department of Health to provide their feedback. Rafi indicated that the Department of Health has a lot on their plates right now, but he is hopeful that they will have an internal DEC DOH call by early next week to discuss whether or not, in the agency's view, the remedial investigation is sufficiently complete and whether any additional field investigation is warranted as part of the remedial investigation or, to the contrary, they will be requesting some additional investigation. After DEC and DOH have their internal discussion and I have completed their review, Tom Facillo and I will have another conference call with the agencies to discuss our comments on the supplemental figures and the status of the remedial investigation overall to relay our thoughts and discuss the agency's findings. I will provide you an update after that conference call has occurred. With respect to timing, I expect our follow-up call with DEC and DOH to take place either right before the Christmas holiday or right after the new year. It depends on whether or not DEC and DOH complete their review by the end of next week. Rafi could not estimate when the draft remedial investigation report would be submitted by Langan, given that the agencies are still reviewing what has been submitted to date but the draft remedial investigation report is clearly not going to be prepared for submission this calendar year. I will provide DEC her comments on the supplemental figures week's end, and I will follow up to Rafi by the middle of next week if I don't hear from him before that. That's the end of her statement. Thanks, Diana. Um, of course, this was on the update for anyone that was came in late by Laura Dodge, the community's consultant on the what on 215 Water Streets um, remedial investigation plan. Any, I don't think we could ask or answer any questions other than um, what you've heard is I think that's the update that we're getting. And we will, of course, as is stated there, have further updates, obviously. So um, I think from there, um, unless anyone has some comment, We'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the zoning for coastal flood resiliency citywide zoning text amendment. Which um, is James um, is, it, is it Cotone or cotton? I usually <laughs> yeah, say Cotone. Cotone. <laughs> Hi, James. So James Cotone, um, the resiliency planner with the land use division at the New York City C Council was very, very kind to volunteer and come today to uh, help us out to just discuss further thoughts on, we've had one conversation on the city one, the citywide zoning text amendment and how it affects community board one. Um, so um, I think this is kind of a discussion uh, comments for those of you who need a refresher. This was something that was presented to us at the last um, joint, I think, EPC and land use meeting. Um, and I'll just read right from the New York City Planning's website what this is in brief. This work is part of the city's one New York City plan, which includes numerous strategies to make the city more resilient through multiple lines of defense. This proposal would make permanent zoning provisions that were adopted on a temporary basis in 2013 and improve them in several key areas where the rules do not fully support or may contribute to discouraging resiliency investments in buildings. The proposal would also provide flexibility for grading and shoreline design in waterfront areas to help mitigate flood risk and will prohibit the construction 
of new nursing homes in high risk areas, given the negative health consequences associated with evacuating nursing home residents. So, James, do you want to comment a bit about where you're at at the council in reviewing this application or this uh, yeah, application and uh, thoughts as they concern community board 1. Sure, um, thanks. Just to introduce myself, my name is James Catone. I'm a planner with the New York City Council of Land Use Division. I specialize in resiliency. Um, this text amendment is currently at the community board level review stage of ULERP, so the council is not necessarily considering it uh, as such, except that members are, some members are receiving briefings, uh, and some members are fairly familiar with this text as, as some of it is um, updates to texts that have been in place since 2013 or 2015 in some cases. Um, this is technically a non ULERP action, but it will be following the ULERP calendar because it's going forward with two neighborhood level rezonings uh, in Howard Beach, uh, Old Howard Beach and Garrison Beach, which have some relationship with the resiliency um, text amendment. So the, the goal as, as you sort of read off there uh, of this text amendment is to provide additional flexibility in the city's floodplains to facilitate resilient um, building renovation projects um, and new construction um, to sort of allow the zoning to better accommodate what the building code requires if you're working in a floodplain. Um, and I should say I'm I um, I'm happy to you know uh, answer questions as they come up in the discussion. Um, with respect to uh, community board one, I did kind of poke around a little bit um, on the zoning text and the local kind of zoning conditions there. Um, so community board one has a couple of special purpose districts. There's the lower Manhattan special purpose district and the battery park city special purpose district. Um, the lower Manhattan and the uh, Tribeca special mixed use district. Uh, the lower Manhattan special purpose district includes the seaport city sub district. And the um, the uh, I think that might be the only one. Oh no! And then the uh, commercial historic commercial core subdistrict. Um, the zoning flood. To, and it, it also has a number of historic districts. So there's several in Tribeca. Um, there's the Seaport City Historic District. Um, there's a few small ones in kind of the core of Manhattan. There's the Francis Tavern block, there's the Commons and African Burial Ground, and uh, and Governor's Island also counts as a, a special purpose district. So there's a lot of special districts and historic districts in CB1. Um, for the most part, the way that the zoning text is going to interact with that is um, in cases where the zoning text amendment and the local special purpose district come into conflict, the um, the new flood text, the the resiliency text, will control in the in cases where there's a conflict. Um, and the main situations where I saw that that might be of concern um, to the committee and to residents is. Primarily with respect to how building height would be measured and uh, and floor area ratio. Um, so in Tribeca and Battery Park City, um, building height is measured from the curb height. Um, on Governor's Island, it's measured from the base plane, um, which I uh, asterisk on that because I would need to look into that further to understand it better. But if we're just looking at Manhattan. Um, the new flood text amendment will allow uh, a new project or a substantial improvement. So that's uh, any project that's uh, costs more than 50% of the market value of the building. Uh, if you're doing a new project or a substantial improvement, you have to comply with current building code, which will um, have certain provisions with respect to flood resiliency. That's in Appendix G of the New York City Building Code. Um, what the zoning text allows is for you to measure your building height from the base flood elevation or from an alternative reference plane that you can set at 10 feet above grade. So what that effectively means is that in some parts of these special purpose districts, say in Tribeca or in Battery Park City, if you were building a new building, um, effective height limits are essentially increased by 10 feet. 
um, to accommodate um, more restricted uses um, on the ground floors and in basement levels of a building and floodplain um, to kind of incentivize and make and provide increased flexibility to design designers, architects, and professionals. Um, in historic districts, any work still has to be approved by the Landmarks Planning Commission. And so um, all the normal rules would apply. So even if the height limit, so if, if you um, were working on a historic building in Tribeca um, and you were moving, say, mechanical equipment from a basement level to a, uh, a roof extension or to a backyard extension, um, all the normal conditions at LPC uh, would normally care about in that situation would still apply and be subject to their approval. Um, so that was a lot of information uh, based on discussion I had with some members of the community board uh, last week. Um, uh, and I can probably answer more questions as they come up, but I'm not sure we're at the uh, direction of the discussion um, should take at this point. I think I've spoken enough. Well, that was really helpful. Um, it's a vast yeah, piece of information and how it affects us is also really difficult to tease out, particularly if you don't have any expertise. Um, so thank you. Um, I just want to ask Diana, I, I thought Allison Brown from the Department of City Planning was joining us. Is she here or was she able? She is. Um, give me one moment. She's on a dial-in. Just bear with me. I'm, I'm going to unmute all the dial-ins. I'm not sure which one she is. Um, hi, can you hear me? Oh, oh hi, Allison. Hi, on first Hello. try. Hi, Allison. I, I just want to zero seven number. If that helps. Gotcha. <laughs> I'm sure I'm the only one. <laughs> I just want to Hi, give a, a special shout out to um, Allison Brown from the Department of City Planning for for a lot of things, but mostly for right now for coming tonight at incredibly short notice. I think like an hour before. Um, so thank you. And and I, Allison is a person who can help us a great deal in answering some questions on this um, zoning for coastal flood resiliency. So and also Governor's Island and probably a million other things. So anyway. Um, I think at this point, should we open it up for questions from the committee members? Does anyone, just to remind everyone, tonight is a conversation, again, giving us a little additional time to look at this, um, uh, this citywide zoning text amendment and ask our questions. And then it's next week at, um, is it next week or two weeks? No, it's December, sorry, Diana, when is the executive committee meeting? Um, I'm pretty sure it was moved. It was on the 16th. I think every was moved to the 21st. Nope, we're still the 16th. Yeah, okay. Exec is still the 16th. Okay. So uh, tonight is a good time to ask your questions, get some more information, um, tease out your thinking, but that meeting next week will be the one where the community board will write the resolution on behalf of the community on this text amendment. So. Um, don't hold back with questions or concerns or issues and such that you'd like included. Uh, okay, so having said that, if I can open it up to committee members first, uh, anyone have any thoughts, comments, or questions on this? Well, that, okay, so I, I see I Michael. I can't figure out how to raise my hand. Wait, Al, I oh, have a question, Laura, but I oh. can't figure out how to raise my hand. <laughs> Okay. I can't Laura, find you that hand. <laughs> Laura, it's okay. Wait, Just shoot. Hand? Laura Star. Our, I don't, it's um, <laughs> so funny. Uh, it's in participants. I'm sorry. It'd be so inept. But Laura, don't worry so, about it. There you are. Okay. I, I really think we have a meeting with our landmarks group because my, like, what I, what I think that this zoning makes a lot of sense. Like if I were a building owner in the South Street Seaport or, or on the Francis Tavern block, I was basically going to lose my first floor economy because of flood issues. You know, I would want to build another story on top. Uh, but I wouldn't want to have to spend my whole life dealing with our landmarks committee on the community board or the landmarks commission. So I actually think this is something that should be out now during this process. And I feel the same way about the 
the shoreline the after natural shoreline, which is, you know, unless the shoreline slopes inward, like open space, it can't really word beyond the bulkhead because of DEC regulations. And this city planning um, is on the tax amendment isn't coordinated with the state DEC. So, you know, I know this from my own professional experience that when the city planning regulations are not coordinated with other sister agencies, it's hell. And I recommend they do the coordination in this process. Well, Laura, it's uh, so. Allison, can you speak to sure. what coordination was done and where where LPC and you know the shoreline question is? Can you can you just respond to that? Absolutely. So, um, so in regards to the first part about LPC, um, you know. Community Board 1 in particular has you know, many historic districts that are also within the floodplain. So absolutely support um, your suggestion, Laura, to you know, bring this to Landmarks Committee and, and have that discussion there. Um, this is a, a, a particular concern, I think, for this community district. Um, I will say, you know, as, as James noted earlier, a lot of the provisions are making permanent um, or we feel improving upon uh, provisions that have been in the zoning resolution since 2013. So, you know, as far as coordination with LPC, this isn't new information. This is things that buildings could have been utilizing this text in, in a form. Um, you know, maybe things are being slightly changed in, in this iteration, but, um, Building owners could have been using these provisions since 2013 for seven years. So I, I think a lot of those, um, a lot of that coordination and communication has already come through. LPC is a sister agency. Um, you know, obviously, we have communicated with her, with them, and um, you know, they're obviously very aware of this text going through at this time. Um, and I, I, I don't. Is the concern there? I just want to kind of narrow down. Is the concern that LPC may not um, approve of a project of the resiliency measures of a project because they do not feel that it is in keeping with the nature of the historic district? Is that the concern? Yeah, I mean, yes. For you know, mm -hmm. like if somebody mm -hmm. wants to build a modern, you know, glass whatever on top or something like uh, you know yeah i just want to make sure that it's yeah, coordinated I mean, with them and that you know if there's any guidelines that we need to have that are specific to our historic districts you know mm -hmm. that we really start to think about them because i just hate like i'll give you an example of where i'm coming from okay sure what, what came absolutely. to what came to the landmarks committee a couple of years ago was a co-op <laughs> wanted to build an elevator bulkhead on their roof so that people could get to their green roof, you know, handicapped people, every, so it was universally accessible. Mm -hmm. And we, we had to discuss this for a long time. And that just seemed absurd to me because obviously if you're going to have green roofs, you need to have a way to get for everybody, even people in wheelchairs to get to them. And, mm -hmm. you know, it should have been like, this stuff needs to be considered completely, you know? And so my concern is, that as a community board member, we're going to end up talking ad nauseum about somebody's building an extra story on their building on Water Street or Front Street or something when mm -hmm. they should just be able to do it. And, you know, like somebody's going to say, oh, it's too modern, it's too this, it's too that. So why not talk about it now and just say what the parameters are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we, like I said, LTC is very aware of the tax and and it's it's really not this isn't really a proposal to change their process. Um, you know, if if um via the zoning tax, let's say hypothetically, a property owner of a historic building and historic district wanted to um, you know, flood proof in some way the building and then um as a result of that they ended up adding additional height to the building. 
Um, Mm -hmm. In any situation where there's an additional height added to a building, um, and I've seen these projects go through, and I know the landmark and um, the land use committee have also seen these go through in the last few years in Tribeca, where, um, you know, a building owner has um, gone through a special permit process to add an additional story onto their uh, building in a historic district. You know, it's, it's the same process and the same considerations will be put forth into that by the LPC. It's not changing their process. So, um, you know, I, I think it's maybe a conversation for you all to have at the committee level of if you feel strongly that projects that come in that seek that additional height for resiliency purposes should be, you know, um, analyzed or discussed in a different way, then that's definitely a, a great conversation to have now. So everyone is in agreement before, you know, a, a project may be received in the future. Um, but LPC's process, like their technical process of reviewing things, is not suggesting mm-hmm. to modify this part of this. Um, and then, and yes. sorry, to your, to your comment about, oh, sorry, can you, can you hear me? I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, your question about uh, DEC and shoreline, is, is this in mm-hmm. regards to like any sort of shoreline extension project or could you just clarify? Well, let's say, mm-hmm. let's just take, okay, let's take an example. Like, let's say sure. mm-hmm. near the South Street Seaport, like near the Brooklyn mm-hmm. Bridge Esplanade, you said, mm-hmm. oh, geez, there's this bulkhead. It's so unnatural. Like, it should be, like, we want a softer shoreline. We want more contact <laughs> sure. with the water, mm-hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. So what, what your language says is, okay, you can have your softer shoreline, but you have to slope from the bulkhead back in to get it which would eliminate the esplanade and the public space there because you can't slope out from the bulkhead without going through agony with DEC, right? And so so it's basically not really helping us. So um, I want to be really clear that the test, so there's, you know, as we like to say in the city, like multiple layers of defense that are all being pursued at the same time. Uh, you know, some in regards to infrastructure, like flood walls and barriers, um, that, and some in this instance are really down to private property owners in the floodplain. And this text is really, you know, geared towards ensuring that private property owners that are in the floodplain can seek, uh, you know, resilient options for their private investment. Um, so this doesn't, I well, wait, there's no private property in lower, as far as I know, the only exactly. private property along the whole, what we call the U, is actually the yes. Battery Maritime Building, and that's it. And it wouldn't even apply Correct. there because there's Correct. a ferry. So it's irrelevant to us. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, that's what okay. I was just okay. going to say. You beat me to it with a bunch. But in other, okay. in other parts of the city, remember, this is a citywide tax. There are instances in the city where, you know, uh, a private property will be directly on the shoreline. Um, but those particular provisions really don't have a lot of applicability in uh, Community District 1. Yeah. Um, but I will say, you know, question. other, you. other, but other waterfront projects, I mean, now, now I'm using my community board time for, for something professional, but, mm-hmm. you know, though, when, when you, when one is doing like a waterfront development, right. Mm-hmm. And the developer is developing that waterfront esplanade, they, mm-hmm. if, if they slope back from, you know, the, the, their property line, they'll lo- they, they won't be in compliance with the city planning waterfront zoning guidelines with the, you know, the whatever it is, 12 foot esplanade and the 12 foot, you know, all that stuff that you guys have. So it's right. It's, so, yeah, it's again, it's it's two different provisions, I think, in the text that we're talking about. Um, I mean, I know I know that you have personally done professional work and re- that, you know, has to comply with the waterfront public access areas. Right. And um, in this text is we're really talking about uh, privately owned um, buildings uh, okay. that have a footprint in the in the floodplain. Um, OK. Yeah. All right. You're, you're too well, much of an expert, Laura. <laughs> no, no, I'm just trying <laughs> to get too difficult to certain things. I'm trying to use this process to loosen a few things up. That's all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> OK, that's it for me. Great. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. OK, thanks. Thank and you. Thanks, Alice. OK, bye.
<laughs> okay. Um, why don't we um, hear from Michael Kramer? Head next hand up. Michael? Michael Kramer? No. Okay. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Would I be correct in assuming that in a um, in the seaport where there's a 120 foot height limit that you can only build to 110 feet? Sorry, could you could you repeat the question? So you have a hard and fast 120 foot height limit due due to the down zoning. Does that mean a new development could be no no taller than 110 feet? Plus the 10 feet of resiliency. No, no, the, um, so essentially what, what the text allows for is that the point that you're measuring from, instead of measuring, say, from the curb, you're measuring from a, a reference plane that is 10 or sorry, not from the curb. Sorry. Let me, let me start in. If a building is located in a floodplain, you are you're measuring the height of that building from the base flood elevation. That base flood elevation may be, um, you know, higher, likely is higher than what you know today as the curve. Um, it can, it will vary, as, you know, the topography varies within the floodplain. What the text allows is if the building pursues certain flood protection measures, um, that meet standards set out in the text, then they are allowed to measure from um, a reference plane that is 10 feet higher than that flood elevation. So essentially, instead of in this example, you're saying 120 foot building, it would be a 130 foot building. So it overrides the, the existing down zone. Uh, it overrides the existing text amendment that is that is uh, the I think you're referring to the South Street Seaport subdistrict in Lower Manhattan, where where the 120 feet rule applies. Um, so it allows for that 120 feet to be measured from a different point, which is 10 feet above. Um, so it's effectively resulting in a 130 foot tall building. All right, and the other and question again, I have, Alice. Yeah, thank you, Alice. And, and the other question I have is when we're dealing with coastal resiliency, sometimes the solutions are things like coastal retreat right. or stormwater retention. Um, will, will this zoning, uh, these text amendments allow those types of public purposes? So this text doesn't speak to those um, sorts of measures. Again, this is really talking about if you're a private property owner in the floodplain, ways and you have to comply with appendix g in the building code how can we ensure that um you are able to comply without being uh penalized essentially and making sure that the the building code requirements and the zoning uh resolution requirements are in line rather than in conflict um so uh you know things measures like you were talking about you know um th those are really i see them more as like larger uh, infrastructure um, and, and policy uh, decisions that, you know, this, this particular text doesn't really contemplate. Um, I would probably would like to direct you to our website for more information about um, maybe those sorts of policies. And I can follow up with Diana perhaps after or Alice after this and, and provide some links if helpful. Yeah, uh, yeah I just want to run that task force. That's yeah. why I asked. I just wanted to piggyback on Michael's comment because it's also of interest to me. Um, you know, in your uh, in the text amendment, it states very clearly, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe it was the presentation. I think I quoted it in some areas where flood risk is exceptional, including where sea yeah. level rise will lead to future daily tidal flooding. There is a yeah. need to limit future density to decrease the exposure to damage and disruption. And my question mm -hmm. was going to be, where is this approach being considered in the city of New York? Uh, specifically in community board one. I mean, that's a policy stated in, in the text amendment. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll have to get back to you with more detailed information on that. Um, there are some local actions that are going alongside this application and um, uh, in neighborhoods in uh, Brooklyn and Queens um, that 
I believe, and I, please don't quote me on this, I, I believe some of those local actions are seeking to, um, over time, you know, decrease density or proposing a, a lower density than what exists today. Um, so that in the future, you know, you can if, if I might. It's a mm -hmm. critical question. I mean, it's absolutely critical. You see cities all over the world taking that tact, and yet here we are in New York City, and we really haven't, you know, I'm not saying that the city has to take that tact, but they still have to address it head on. And um, so I would say that's, to me, a, a, a right. missing element from the, from, from the text. If, if so I again, might just this just isn't jump. something I'm well versed in, so if I could provide more information to the community board after this meeting on, on um, you know, retreat, uh, I, I would love to do that. Thanks yeah, awesome. I believe the question there is referring to the um, the special coastal high risk zone overlay, which is a tool that the Department of City Planning has to limit density in areas of special high risk. Um, and the two neighborhood actions that are moving forward at the same time is this text amendment in um, I believe it's Old Howard Beach and Garrettson Beach uh, in Queens and Brooklyn. Those are implementation of that special um, coastal risk zone. Um, it's exactly. a tool, yeah. It's a tool that I believe DCP is implementing kind of in in small steps in communities where there's a strong strong community support for limiting development and density. I'm just saying that you, what your definition is is of course correct, but you know, arguably the high risk area is covers Governor's Island, for example. So you know, you would ask yourself, you know, that fundamental question, and I'm sure on some people's mind is, you know. Is this the right approach? Um, so it, it's just one that I, I find is there's so little literature on it, so little stated about it, and it comes up a lot. And so I'm hopeful that as we go forward, that this gets addressed more. Anyway, I'm sorry to throw myself in there. Anyway, Michael, were you finished? Um, yeah, just the comment that, you know, looking for alternatives to shoreline extension in FIDI and the seaport, these are strategies that could be used. And they're they're missing in this in this text, and certainly a moratorium on density is missing in this text. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, so I have um, from our committee um, Bob Schneck next. Hey, Bob. Bob, oh there you go. Okay, okay. I just wanted to make a. Uh, uh, put this in some kind of perspective so I can understand it and various effects. I think um, all of this is going to have. Um, this is a flood text amendment and to my understanding, it's to make compliance easier with uh, resiliency requirements and that there'll be a mandatory, um, there'll be mandatory compliance with the appendix G and that the, a flood map is coming. And the flood map is going to be formalized within the next, within the near nearest, within the near future. All of these effects are going to have tremendous, will have be tremendously expensive for property owners. Even big property owners are going to face some big ex expenses with this. So I'm just looking at since we've we've considered. Um, the the administration has con considered the text amendment itself. Has it also considered these other things? Well, on my list, starting was the idea of retreat. So uh, we're in line with with you, Alice, and with uh, Mr. Kramer. Then the next thing is the effect on insurance rates. If if these things are going to happen and we're going to have uh, new flood maps. How do if if you are compliant? How does it affect your insurance rates? And has the is the city really involved with the, with the, that kind of question? Next is the finances for renovation. These things are going to be very very expensive, and even though the idea here is to alleviate those costs or reduce them, there's still going to be something. So they're going to be really considerable. So what options is the city considered finance? for how to make these things possible. The next thing that I was thinking about is for new buildings, this at least is an advantage because you can build to the new standards. But if you have a building that isn't like that, the expenses for um, compliance with Appendix G really are expensive and they are mandatory. 
so a lot of a lot of owners are going to have trouble kind of bridging that gap between where they are now and where the mandatory requirements put them and someone had to have thought about how to make that possible the final thing i was thinking about is the communication of these things with all of these owners of different kinds that someone contemplated how to present this to them and how to make it possible for them to work with these new changes because even to understand these things within the context of a community board is taxing to someone like me anyway and to lots of owners i think these things are really difficult and threatening so that's my observation um Thank you. These are all really excellent questions and, and observations, as you said, and um, I uh, greatly appreciate all of them. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of what you're we're talking about, you know, is in regards to from the property owner's perspective of concerns about uh, finances and insurance and um, you know, communication of this information in a in a manageable way, and I think that's all really important. And I'm so glad to hear, um, you know, you community board member raising those concerns. Um, uh, you know, I I think um, again, I, I you ask a lot of really good questions, and I think if I can provide um, perhaps our our full um, kind of briefing docket document um, uh, to the committee following this meeting. It's, it's right on our website, um, but I can, you know, just share a link so it's, it's easy to find. Um, I, I think it'll answer or um, speak to at least many of your questions and concerns raised. I think what I'm really trying to express here, if I were a property owner and I were confronted with this very a uh, threatening wave of legislation and I actually had to comply with it. It would be I've, I've been talking to lots of small business owners downtown and they're they're really under tremendous threat right now and they yeah. <laughs> and to see people that put their lives in the businesses scared to death like that. It's uh, I'm operating under that effect because I saw some of those guys this this afternoon, but the same principle holds for anyone who tries to operate in the context of New York. It's really expensive, really complex, and you need six lawyers even to figure out mm -hmm. how, to, how to address this, this, the idea of this text amendment is to make it easier to comply with resiliency requirements. Mm -hmm. but it's still awfully hard. <laughs> and we still have Absolutely. all these questions. Yeah. I'm, I'm from, I've looked through a lot of those documents you refer us to and followed mm -hmm. those links before, and they just make me more confused. <laughs> oh, <laughs> if I look at them carefully, I, 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 they're more confusing. Yeah. So I'm just looking for ways we can kind of help people that actually are overwhelmed with these requirements. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely, um, you know, I agree. It's, it's, it's really difficult, you know, being a property owner, small business owner, um, especially in, in in these times, um, you know, where the text is trying to help, it's trying to, you know, create, you know, we were in a situation before where it was, it was difficult to comply with both the building regulations and the zoning resolution, which is just, you know, a, never a situation that one wants to be in. Um, and we're hoping that this helps to not only, you know, remove those conflicts, but also, um, you know, help with some of those uh, you know, financial concerns that you mentioned. Um, but, you know, I, sorry, you can probably hear my dog in the background. Um, I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's very, it's very difficult, um, especially right now. I just will offer, um, Allison, one thought that I had been going through all of the documents and, and this committee did actually receive all the documents and in fact, got the YouTube tape of the city planning commission, um, you know, uh, certification hearing, but um, I'm just right. curious, you know, it just seems to me that there's just not enough examples, you know, like Laura Starr gave an example of something or 
Bob, it's it's really helpful to give the example, see how it plays out, and frankly, see a graphic of what we're talking about. I think there's not enough of that in this text, often in many texts, but particularly here. And I'm just wondering if that might assist at all in making this just a, a more clear and usable document, but just mm -hmm. throwing it that out there. Um, um, thank you. So I think next up, um, looks like all of on the committee. So, um, well, Tammy, um, Helter. So, Allison, one of the questions that came up that I'm learning so much more information every time I hear some more about the text amendment is about the special uh, zone that you're referring back to Howard Beach. I am sort of confused and concerned only because Community Board 1 in Manhattan was so highly affected from Superstorm Sandy and your modeling of the map with the new overlay certainly changes so much of the landscape in Community Board 1 to ask why aren't we actually included? Why is it a special district that has to be set up for that? And why isn't CB1 included there? Because we are on record mm -hmm. a thousand ways to Sunday, not wanting huge giant development. We have already been flooded. We had over a year's worth of generators on the streets and other things like that. So I'm, I'm very curious about this and how CB1 is not considered along our shorelines based on the amount of additional coverage the zoning text adds to our community board. Why, why aren't we some kind of an exception for developing? Um, Sorry, could you repeat that last part? Why aren't we what? Some sort of exception to density and development along the water, the floodplain. Um, so, are you referring to why was there not a? Just, I'm just trying to clarify. There wasn't a local. I, I mentioned some neighborhoods that have local actions. Why was there not a local action uh, for Community Board One? Yeah. By the, the citywide text, which applies. Well, yeah, because when you look at the map and the overlay was and what now is. You've taken from a rim of the coastline around community board one and moved into probably, I mean, I'm not sure the percentages, I haven't done the math, but it certainly does seem like all of a sudden in community board one, we're now 65% covered by this new ruling. Whereas before it was maybe 30% along the edges and not even all of governors, but now it's 100% of the islands um, in our district. So. If the coverage needed to be adjusted so drastically for community board one, knowing that we have historic districts, knowing that we were flooded, why are we looking at additional density and FAR giveaways when we fall into the exact verbiage that you describe in the text amendment as not preferable for that? If, um, the, if you're referring to the special coastal risk district, to be clear, the special coastal risk district restricts use to single family detached homes. And so that tool wouldn't be particularly appropriate for community board one. And I think that from, I mean, um, I shouldn't speak for the Department of City Planning, but I think that from the perspective of the Department of City Planning, Manhattan community board one is the sort of place where zoning will is, is going to have to be assumed to be playing in conjunction with large infrastructure projects in the long run. I would uh, completely agree with that. Thank you, James. That, you know, retreat, coastal retreat in, you know, if there's any place in New York City or, or in the United States, for that matter, where retreat from the coastline is probably probably makes less sense than investing in large infrastructure projects. Lower Manhattan is probably that place. But all of a sudden now we're being, you know, my concern is how, how it affects the historic districts and our special districts. Because as you know, from what we talked, it is um, 
and what Laura even mentioned, the interplay of the historic district and the coastal resiliency and the height and the contextuality and the um, heights of the buildings and usage on ground level are critical to keeping you know, I don't want to see a 10 foot wall around the ground floor used for storage and reach, you know, that doesn't bring life and vibrancy to the community other than plants. Oh, absolutely. And so what, what the, what this text does in those kinds of situations, if you imagine um, a mixed use building um, in Tribeca, for example, where the ground floor is retail and then the upper floors are residential use. What this text would allow is for the property owner to make the ground floor dry flood proof. So it would have waterproof aquarium glass windows and a floodproof door, perhaps a, um, a flood panel that you would lock into place in front of the door. And the, the walls would have to be structurally reinforced to deal with the loading of flood water. Um, all of that expense could be to some extent recouped. And also, if you have to move any mechanical equipment could be recouped by adding some additional space on the top of the building. Um, why does it have to be recouped for building something so your building is sound for new construction? If 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 I'm going to build a house, I need to build it to its sound. So why did they have to? Why I don't understand why there's a recoup. I can understand for buildings that are existing, but why there the, the recoup is more intended for for existing buildings than new buildings, um, and for new buildings, I suppose. It, it would provide additional flexibility um, with respect to um, where you put the particular equipment. So you, if you have some additional flexibility with your FAR, if you can, if you have some additional flexibility with the FAR, it gives designers additional flexibility. I, I, I take the point that for new for new construction, it seems less um, critical to give the to give FAR exemptions, but. I guess it's difficult to differentiate in the zoning text between new construction and I mean, we talk about new construction versus substantial improvement. Um, Why is it difficult? Can you explain that to me? Um, I guess I don't mean difficult. I guess I mean. Um, you sort of would be setting up 2 sets of rules, 1 for existing buildings and 1 for new buildings. Um, and existing buildings already only have to comply with the building code um, flood protection with the resiliency requirements of the building code. Existing buildings only need to comply with current code if they are engaging in a substantial improvement, which is more than 50% of the value of the building. So that would be a pretty extensive renovation or if the property owner wanted to take it upon themselves for one reason or another to go to do a flood proofing project um, that had no other changes to the building. Um, I actually find it sort of, I, I, I feel like I would be surprised if someone who owned a, you know, six story, um, attached building, if they were flood proofing the ground floor, they got 30, the first 30 feet of the ground floor FAR would be exempted. I find it sort of hard to believe that they would then decide I'll build a 30 foot deep penthouse unit on top of this building, uh, to quote unquote, recoup the costs of. This flood improvement project that I just paid for, um, I mean, you could, I suppose, generate more income from that unit. If it was a, you know, apartment or something, but Dave, you just hit on exactly the problem that we have with the water street text amendment. 1 of the major issues that I have with the water street text amendment is developers. Not only got a floor area bonus. For doing public space, but then we're allowed to enclose the public space. And privatize some of it, so they are double bonus and whether that was intended or not is immaterial to the fact that that's the way the text amendment lands. And Allison knows exactly what I'm talking about. And those are the kinds of loopholes while not intended are very viable and actually very flexible for the owners to a level that. Does not service as community benefit for what they're getting. Right. It, it's worth saying, and I guess um, it's worth pointing out that there's no, the word bonus probably has a connotation that there's some additional FB, FAR that's being awarded for these improvements. It's really more, you're not suffering the, uh, the, the, 
It's a deduction and a reallocation. Right, right. right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, um, I, sorry, and I and I don't mean to to interrupt again, um, James. I thank you. No, please do. <laughs> You're doing a great job. You're doing a great job representing the decks. I'm I'm really impressed. Um, I just want to say that I, um, you know, I if I think, Tammy, these are these seem to not be so much questions or, or as much as suggestions for alteration. And if that's the case, um, you know, perhaps these are things that should be included in, in some sort of resolution. Um, it, unless I'm, unless I'm missing something, if you're still, if there's a confusion, I, I know we've, we've talked about, um, I want to ask all the on, on to multiple occasions. So I get it. I just want to, we will be doing a resolution, but if I don't ask and I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, ask about any of that, then I don't know what the answer is. I mean, why put it in a resolution sure. yeah. if you can't? You know what I mean? Okay. Mm -hmm. With the um, with the ground floor flood proofing part of the text, I actually, I, I realize that I've answered this question in some contexts without pointing out that actually the, the current temporary provisions in zoning allow um, allow for a property owner to exempt the total ground floor area of the building if um, if they do a dry flood proofing, whereas the tech that this text amendment reduces that to only the first 30 feet from the from the um, street frontage. And the reason that that has been changed is that there were some projects that DCP noticed where developers were building an unusually short first floor so that they could capture that benefit and make a taller building. Um, so this is uh, intended to provide a more appealing and um, attractive uh, ground level street street front. Um, and removing that, you know, quote loophole, as you you know right. mentioned earlier, Tammy. Like we're, we have had the opportunity, you know, with this text, which isn't normal to essentially have a beta version out for seven years and have learned from that experience. Um, and we hope that you know have been able to improve upon it. So that's that's one of those ways. Um, Tammy, are you good there? Should we move on. Thank you. Okay, Rosa Chang. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Allison and James. Uh, this is definitely something that's of enormous importance to our community. So I appreciate you guys coming here to help us with some of our questions. Um, I agree with all the prior speakers that flood proofing is an entirely different proposition for existing buildings versus as yet unbuilt buildings. And I do feel quite strongly that they should be treated differently because of that. Um, and then my more specific questions. Um, and I'm, I believe Diana actually has a list of my questions, so you'll probably be getting a copy of them. But the ones that I'm hoping you can sort of clarify for me today. Um, one is to deal with permitted obstructions. Uh, one was in permitted obstructions in open space um, and then permitted obstructions in required yards, uh, courts and open spaces for all zoning lots. So for the first one, um, I'm concerned that generators, et cetera, have, um, you guys know, a minimum distance of three to five feet from the lot line. Uh, and even when enclosed or screened, there's a concern of noise and exhaust for both the property owner as well as the neighbors. And that's, I'm wondering about why it's allowed to be so close to the lot lines. Um, and then also in yards, et cetera, um, it allows for flood control devices uh, to be stored um, in any open space, which to me goes against the entire purpose of provide, requiring that that open space be provided. So that's question one. Um, Do you want me to I, I think going, this is or? a, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I, I think I'd ask if you're going to provide these, um, in written form, that would be very helpful. That's, uh, a little too technical for, for me. And unfortunately, no one's from our, our zoning team could join us today. Um, okay. who were, you know, really the authors of the text. So, um, I'd love to get that question in writing and I can share it with them and get back to you, but thank you. Okay, I believe Diana does have that one. Um, the other okay, one great. was a measurement of height for flood resistant buildings. Um, there's a section that carves out quality housing buildings. And I was wondering why that was. 
Um, I think again, goes. these are great technical questions that are unfortunately not <laughs> in my wheelhouse. So um, again, if I could get that question in writing and I can get back to you. Okay. Um, Thank you. And the next one was um, special floor area modifications for flood resistant buildings and flood proofed ground floors. It says um, for developments, the first story above flood elevation is 13 feet or more above the level of the adjoining sidewalk. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess I was wondering why. And, uh, so, yeah, I, I think that that kind of goes back to what James just touched upon about um, ensuring that you essentially wouldn't have uh, like sneak in like a four foot tall first floor. Um, and count that as a first floor and, and still get some sort of um, additional space. It, it, it was kind of a, I guess let's say a loophole that we realized with the previous text that resulted in um, not a great uh, pedestrian experience. And um, that's why there's now a height minimum. <laughs> Um, oh, so am I misunderstanding that then, that you are not saying that um, it could go up to 13 feet? You're saying it must be under? Um, I thought it was that it was at least. I think, again, sorry, I, if you could provide this one in a written form, that would be very helpful. These are highly technical questions, which I always love, but <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to um, misstate the wrong thing. Um, okay. And then the last one um, was for special permits for modifications of certain zoning regulations. It says any modification of height and setback regulations related to increasing the permitted overall height shall not exceed the maximum height permitted by the applicable underlying district regulations by 10% or 10 feet, whichever is greater. So I guess I'm wondering why greater. And does does that mean that if that 10% of the maximum building height of 300 feet, then now it goes 330 feet? I'm I'm thinking of a very specific um, situation mm -hmm. like uh, the Governor's Island. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I, I understood that reference. Yeah, mm -hmm. because that um, sounds like that's a gift of 30 feet. Yeah, I, sorry, I'm going to have to get back to you on that as well. But thank you. These are all great technical questions. I, I do appreciate you doing so much um, due diligence. Um, yeah, uh, it, I guess it, I guess my point, though, is that um, it, it, as everyone has said in, in prior comments, I mean, it is an enormous challenge for an existing building to retrofit themselves. And I do believe that the give back um, to help defray the cost of that work and effort um, is appropriate. But I think that when you're talking about a new building and especially a very large um, lot new building uh, mm -hmm. with a lot of street frontage, I understand the change that you made to make it so that it's only the, the floor area to set back 30 feet from the, the sidewalk is taken out. But for instance, in a property like 250 Water or for the Governor's Island um, mm -hmm. post buildings, that's actually enormous. Um, so that's all street frontage, essentially, and it's a it's a significant amount. And then you're allowing those buildings to then um, raise their street wall, maximum street wall height, um, to you know ten feet higher, or possibly more, if if I understand this text correctly, possibly thirty feet mm -hmm. higher, and and then the maximum building height. And so I guess. There's a significant concern that with these sort of larger mega projects, that the um, benefit being received by these is not commensurate with the cost because right now everything's on paper and there isn't a, an enormous cost. I mean, there's obviously the construction cost of doing that extra work, but Mm -hmm. It is not the same cost as it is to, let's say, a landmark existing co-ops between 20 <laughs> unit owners that can't agree in the cost, you know, like it's a sure, yeah. situation. And mm -hmm. so while on in the one hand, I believe that it makes sense. On the other hand, I, I really do believe that it's becoming a very, very large loophole gift to private companies. 
Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we discussed this um, when I when when we presented at the land use committee, um, and I, you know, I think it's a, a very good point. So thank you. Okay, thank you. And I believe Diana has all my more technical questions. Yes, yes thank thank you. You. I Sorry, just I emailed. I just emailed them to you, Allison. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you. I will forward them to my more educated <laughs> uh, coworkers on this on this text. Thank you. Can Can you guys comment a little bit about um, in terms of going green? Eventually, uh, there will be battery storage in buildings, um, on roofs, uh, you know, maybe inside some of the other, you know, this has come up before and this is unclear still because of battery safety. Um, but is this addressed, you know, is this something that you're addressing in terms of putting solar panels on roofs and then there'll be battery storage and this type of thing? Can we talk a little more about that? Um, I, cannot talk more about that. I don't, I don't really, um, that, that's not a provision that's part of this text. Uh, James, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add there. Uh, I, I know that one thing that this text does that if one of the things that the citywide text amendment does that applies outside of the floodplain is it allows um, power systems like batteries or um, solar panels um, as permitted obstructions. Um, so it, I guess, um, I guess this text allows backup power as a permitted obstruction for most buildings in most places, but I don't know a great deal more detail than that. What, can you clarify what the question was more specifically? Um, certainly I know you're talking about doing it for, these are individual homes and there's some buildings that you're talking about, but, um. You know, I just think when you're doing a new update in terms of, you know, flood mitigation, you know, part of it is people want to make their buildings green at the same time. Um, you know, that the people might even want to go towards a passive house standard, you know, these types of things. Um, and I understand from up earlier discussions that the passive house standards isn't exactly in line, but, you know, it's getting closer. But I just keep thinking that, you know, batteries and solar panels and everything else are coming as well. Um, just if someone's going to take the time to upgrade their building, this is going to be part of the discussion. Yeah, and uh, from what I understand, this text will will allow will allow those things uh, if you have to put them in. If again, not so much in a Manhattan CB one, bit, but if you have a backyard or a side yard, you'd be allowed to put a battery, you know, a power wall back there, or um, maybe if you had a wind turbine or, or some solar panels and on your roof. Um, so I guess this allows those things. I'm not sure if it incentivizes them per se. And it, there might be some additional flexibility about placement. Uh, I'd have to look at the text again. This this text really isn't um, about it, sorry sustainable building as much as um, you know resiliency from um, flooding and other you know natural hazards. Um, yeah, I think it's included in this text mainly as an as a idea about backup power in case of an outage. Right, right. Um, and I think what you're speaking about is is something different. It's more about sustainability and having a um, maybe a low carbon or carbon neutral building, um, which is um, you know obviously a great thing to do, but not the intent of this text. Okay, thanks, Jason Friedman. Jason, I just wanted to know, uh, did we all have a chance to weigh in on this first zoning text amendment or was that something done like emergency after Sandy by city planning? No, the community word one did pass a resolution on the 2013 text amendment. Um, yeah, we should pull I that, mean, Alice, just to see what we talked about then. Okay. Definitely. I cannot recall the resolution comments, but I know it was approved unanimously. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I can, I think I have that on hand actually. I think I actually downloaded it from the CB1 website. Um, so I can send it to the link to you if you have any difficulty locating it. So if I'm understanding correctly, I mean, I have a series of um, detailed questions a little aligned with some of Rosa's and I don't want to spend the evening going over those either. So is the idea that those of us with many questions that might be what you would call detailed or in the weeds uh, should be just fielded to you and you'll get back to us with the answers? Is that the best way to approach that, Allison and James? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, please keep in mind there's 59 community districts that are all reviewing <laughs> at the same time. So to the extent that you can provide any questions in written form and email them to us um, just so that we can keep track of everything. So it's a little bit of chaos, as you can imagine. Um, I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. And it lets us track things much better. I and just have... please send them as soon as possible so that we have time to respond before um, you're crafting a resolution. So thanks very much. I encourage everyone to do that, to send them to the board, um, and then we will field them out to DCP. I just have two questions if I can ask. Um, just curious that, that it looks like the nursing homes are the only use group that can't be built in the 1% annual chance floodplain. Is that correct? And were other uses considered for that sort of exempted group? Um, I, I'd have to get back to you on that. Um, I, I think the idea was that it was, you know, vulnerable populations, and I think nursing homes are kind of exemplary of the type of population that we're, we're aiming at. I don't know if there's other um, specific buildings or use groups that would fall into that category, so I'll get back to you. My understanding, I mean, absolutely, Allison, uh, double check. My understanding is that it is only nursing homes. Uh, and it's the 1% floodplain and a few specific other parts of the city, uh, namely all of the Harbor Islands and anything south of the Belt Parkway, essentially. Um, so I believe, it, I believe it's only nursing homes. And the idea there being that that's a population where even, even evacuating is uh, kind of traumatic. What about hospitals? Sorry, what was that? Question. Hospitals. I just think of other use groups. It just, I, I just. Um, I, I know this is a question that came up before. So oh. if I could get back to you with our, our uh, response on that, because I, I know we've been asked that question before about, um, you know, other types of uses. So. Okay. So that's a more general question. Then I just have one specific one that's um, been burning in my mind, particularly looking over the Governor's Island text is, is the shore public walkway that's referred to in the text amendment the same as what would be considered the esplanade or promenade that's referred to in the Governor's Island text? Um, no, they are shore public walkway is a zoning defined term. Um, the Waterfront Esplanade, as described in the Governor's Island text, is something unique to Governor's Island. So, in that particular uh, um, interpretation of the text on Governor's Island, would the requirement of, um, you know, a 40-foot minimum width of the promenade, I know there's or over that, in other words, permitted obstructions that are described in the Zoning for Coastal Flood Resiliency text, are those the same that would be considered at Governor's Island. So a landscape berm, for example, could be put in the promenade at Governor's Island as a permitted obstruction. And it could be any size, it seems like, as long as you've left a 40 foot width in that promenade. I just wanted to understand that. I don't know if that's too detailed, sorry, but <laughs> I really want to get that. Um, no, I think that's a great question, um, but I think that's a, a Governor's Island question more than a zone for coastal resiliency question. I mean, I, I understand. Well, that's next on our agenda, but, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, if, if you could also, uh, you know, email that question to me and the applicant for that particular project, the Trust for Governor's Island. Sure. And, uh, you know, we'll review the text and confirm. Um, yeah, terrific. Thanks thank very and much. Yes, I, I know Governor's Island is probably on the line right now, so maybe, right. maybe they want to already jump in. I think we are going to um, move on to that unless I don't oh, actually, I want to open it up to the. Diana, do we have anyone from the public here that would I don't see anybody. Okay. So, um, 
are we set to move on? Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Stacy Shub has a has a question. Let me unmute her right now. Hi, Stacy. Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, Tammy did sort of steal a, a, a bit of my thunder in my question, but I think um, I'd still like some clarification. It's really kind of simple. If we're not talking about a historic building renovation, why does the city feel the need to give financial incentives to a developer building new construction for taking resiliency measures in a flood zone? Um. I, you know, I, I think we've, we've talked about this in, in several times, and I think Rosa, uh, or sorry, was it Rose? Uh, so, sorry, I'm, I'm probably miss saying the person's name who spoke earlier who raised a similar point. Um, uh, you know, I, I think this is something that, um, the, as a citywide text, if you're considering this from all perspectives, so for example, I am, a, you know, somebody who just bought a, I don't even know, vacant lot because it's in New York, but I, I bought a, you know, vacant thousand square foot lot and I'm trying to develop a single family home on it perspective. Um, you know, it, it's, it's very different context than it might be in uh, lower Manhattan. So I would just say that and the type of developers and type of building forms you see in Lower Manhattan, I, you know, that those those costs are expensive. And yes, doing something new versus renovating something is always going to be less expensive, but it's still expensive to to build something to be in a resilient uh, form. So um, I think with all of these, uh, you know, as the community board drafts their resolution, I think it's helpful to keep that in mind that this is a citywide tax amendment and not all of New York City, looks, the majority of New York City looks very different from community board one. Um, and, you know, these provisions are trying to meet the needs of everyone. Okay, um, I guess my the reason for that is you, they're doing something that is prudent for them to be doing for themselves. You're, you're, you're buying a lot, you're building a lot in a flood zone. I just don't see why we have to incentivize them to waterproof their flood, their building in a flood zone, that's all. Well, it's, we're not, just to be clear, they have to comply with the building code if they're building a new building in a flood zone. Right. Um, they have to put, comply with Appendix G. So the zoning, first and foremost, ensures that there are not conflicts with what the building code says versus what the zoning resolution says so that when you're building your building you're not you're in compliance with both sets of rules um and then beyond that um it kind of minimizes or attempts to minimize you know financial hardship as part of trying to be compliant with um the building code i understand the point that you're making um, I, I do, um, and I, you know, similar to the previous point about new buildings versus retrofits, um, you know, we, we appreciate those sorts of comments in the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stacey. Um, oh, I see two more hands have gone up. Okay. Um, David Sheldon. Okay, uh, I'm trying to understand what it would be about Gerritsen Beach and Howard Beach that would warrant special consideration that would not be warranted, say, in Red Hook. Uh, can you help me with that? I, I'd like to point you to information on our website. I, I think we're, um, I think that's it's, it's too long of a conversation to go into at this moment. Um, so I'll, I'll point you to additional information. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I can really say right now. Okay. I wasn't involved in the text at, at that time of deciding which neighborhood. David, we'll add, we'll add that question to the group questions and um, and forward the response. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you. 
Okay, um, Bob, are, is your hand up there, uh, Bob Schneck? Yes. yes, it is. I think that's I just wonder, I've been thinking quite a bit about how to apply this, particularly in CB1, and I spend a lot of time around Pure A, and I imagine Pure A being flooded in that whole first floor, um, designing a first floor that's supposedly <coughs> uh, flood proof, but really there's, tens of thousands of dollars of investment in bars and stairwells, all kinds of bathrooms. It, if it got flooded, it would be onerously expensive anyway. The other kind of things I'm thinking about is in Community Board 1, we have things like Francis Tavern next to a regular building. Those buildings are kind of historic and you, there's nothing we can do to flood proof them, really, except all we can do is really build big defenses around lower Manhattan, rather even than to try and apply these kinds of principles. And the next thing I think about is uh, basements and elevator, ele elevator, escalators rather into basement sales areas, which are very common down here. Um, if there isn't any first floor that you can kind of flood proof and protect, there is, we ha have such vulnerabilities because because the cost of a flooded basement and the flooded first first floor is so onerous. And the next thing is we have things that are related to subways that are very deep, uh, extremely difficult to protect uh, areas. So I don't even trying even trying to imagine how if if I were God I could apply this ruling in Lower Manhattan. It's kind of like we have to make a decision either or either we're going to, you know, kind of make a major defense around this so it doesn't get flooded. Because we really don't have the option of on a particular basis trying to try and trying to protect buildings with with the idea of higher floor uh, flood proofing like like was just said, building a building here in the coastal uh, flood zone shouldn't be allowed in the first place and we shouldn't kind of like go two ways at once and say you have to follow this rule to build something that's flood proof when we shouldn't be building here at all it might can i i'm just trying to express a kind of concern about the difficulties of of trying to to even apply this legislation in lower manhattan I don't know if anybody, James or Allison, will respond. But um, I again, I, I feel like we've discussed this a lot. I think that um, there are ways that historic buildings um, and all the buildings in Lower Manhattan can can utilize um, the text as proposed. I think that um, you know the way that it utilizes the, the build, the way that these buildings will utilize the text is going to be different than you know. Uh, single family detached homes in another borough, perhaps, um, but there's still benefits to lower Manhattan. Thanks. I, I guess um, it's up, what you do here is a lot of people speaking on the same point, and I would guess the city at some point has to kind of identify why this approach in the flood zone, um, you know, basically to increase density or build. Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting question that probably would be worthy of more conversation. Anyway, um, Megan, Megan Malvern. Hi, guys. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Hey, so just really quick along the lines of what Rosa was talking about before, but also um, in relation to COVID and the massive impact that the rent problems that a lot of land uh, building owners are facing in the next couple of months, um, there is a huge likelihood that many, many of the small buildings for like the ones in the seaport or also in Chinatown, when I was talking to Jan from NUBC, they are, they are losing small, um, landlords hand over fist to giant developers who are gobbling up these little, um, small, beautiful character driven communities, and they're going to knock them all down. They're going to take advantage of this FAR. And they're going to completely turn major swaths of New York City from the character driven sort of unique little buildings. They're being incentivized to 
prey on the weakness of these small building owners right now and turn it into a giant profit and to a giant building. It, I think that there's a lot of problems with the way the text is written and how it overly incentivizes the new um, new builds. I just want some the community board to be aware of all the different ways it could be impacting. Um, I think that I, I this text is really about coastal resiliency, and um, I, I understand the the scenario that you're lying out there. I, I don't think that this is going to be a text that um, you know alters or hinders any you know a, a proposal to purchase adjacent properties and amass air rights. Like this doesn't this doesn't affect uh, one way or another a, a developer's ability to do that. So That's I, not I true. Just wanna, why is that not true? Why, how does this text enable a property owner to amass air rights on their property? It doesn't allow them to amass air rights so much as it gives them um, it, use of the ground floor while, while ignoring the square footage that is utilized for that in specific parts of your text. Hi, this is Rosa again. Um, so for instance, that 30 foot setback um, not set back, but the, the yeah, air that comes the 30 foot, right. That, and then being able to still have that as functional usable square footage and yet ignoring the fact that it's there for the purposes of calculating zoning square footage. And, um, and then also the ability to obviously close off any of the permitted obstructions that are now being encompassed with generators, et cetera. Um, whether it be on the roof or whether it be on the um, on in any you know previously open space that they now could possibly occupy, and then of course the um, increase in height um, for both the maximum base height of the building as well as the overall maximum building height. So, so I, I believe the that all of these buildings. So the concern is building will drop forward and then the building will be able to deduct that floor area to a depth of 30 feet. So let's say, I, I don't know, maybe a thousand square feet. It depends on, I guess, the, the, the frontage of the building. Um, and that, that they would then sell those air rights to a neighboring property. And there would be a property that is simply a, a amassing those air rights from all of its neighbors. Well, no, the, the air rights actually can only be, typically air rights can only be transferred to a neighboring property um, right. directly with, said, a neighbor. with which you have at least 10 contiguous feet of adjoinment. So that, that right. to me, that's not specifically a concern, but there is an enormous gift when I agree when you're talking about a smaller lot, then again, you know, I'm fine with that. Um, where I have concern is when you're talking about a lot like, for example, 250 water that has street frontage on all four sides and it is an enormous lot. And therefore, the, the benefit that they receive specifically on those types of projects or like Governor's Island. And, and this is unfortunate because your text amendment is coming up exactly when we are reviewing these two specific properties. Um, <laughs> so, so it's on our mind and we can't really avoid it. But when I look sure, at the text a... amendment with those two properties in mind, I see an enormous giveaway. And that could be dealt with if you say capped some of the benefits um, at a specific square footage, for instance, or if you capped well, it. All the floor, all the floor air reductions are capped. To it depends what? on the building size. It depends on the building size. So um, for instance, you're saying the... 250 water could not then um, utilize basically right off the you know 30 feet back on all four streets and then take their maximum base height up 10 feet and their maximum building height up 10 feet or possibly more as a percentage if that that percentage thing is in play i'm saying that all of the floor area reductions are capped in a certain way um the way that they're capped is described in the text it's usually dependent on you know, wet flood proofing or dry flood proofing or um, deployable panels and storage. And it's a usually a mathematical equation of, you know, how much of the frontage is utilizing that particular 
um, flood proofing measure, uh, as well as the height of the building, the design of the building, the transparency, for example. There's a lot of factors that weigh in, but it's not, it, it's not just a, you know, you get an entire floor written off. There's requirements have to be made and met and then calculations made based off of those requirements that are met. Um, I'm not, I would love it if you could get back to us with that information, because obviously that would then allay a lot of our concerns. If there was, let's say, a benefit cap of, you know, 5,000 square feet or, you know, whatever, um, and it wasn't like 300,000 yes, square feet, that would help. Rosa, that's yes, going to have sir. to go into a resolution. She's not going to be able to get back to us with suggestions for changing. They're not changing no, it. No, but she's, she's saying it exists I already. Can, I can get back to you with the provisions of the tax that explain how the floor error reductions are calculated. That would be excellent. Great. Indeed. Thank you. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, Diana, with that, we are, we've covered everyone's questions on the zoning for coastal resiliency tax. Is that right? Uh, it looks that way and Great. I'll put my email in the chat for anybody who wants to follow up with me um, with a question or, or whatever it might be. And I'll coordinate with Allison to get responses on these things and we'll circulate them back out. So, just again, that everybody understands this was really helpful. I'm really glad that we got to, to speak a little bit more on this incredibly important text amendment. And I really thank James and Allison for coming at the last minute and helping us out with it. So we have another round of this when the resolution will actually be written, as you know, next week. Sorry, is that right? The 21st. I'm constantly. Uh, 16th, 16th. 16th. Yes. I'm sorry, the 16th. Uh, and um, so please do send all your questions and comments that you would like included at that time, because obviously at one meeting, it would, we're not going to have you know, hours to flesh it all out. So this is why we're doing it, some of this tonight. So thanks very much for all the um, participation. Um, really appreciate it. So now we'll be moving on to, you know, it's like the trifecta. <laughs> we went from 250 Water Street to the citywide coastal zoning text amendment, and now we're going to Governor's Island. Um, so here again, just to be clear, the resolution on the zoning map and the text amendments will happen at the Land Use and Zoning meeting on December 14th next week. Tonight, we're talking just a little bit about environmental impact, specifically as it concerns resiliency and sustainability. Again, to kind of inform our resolution coming up, or in fact, we've discussed the possibility of having a separate uh, resolution on the EIS, which in fact will happen in February. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, um, Diana, could you just confirm that that's correct, that's correct, that we in fact could have another meeting in January with this committee to discuss the EIS in more detail? Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And Sarah confirmed that with me today. We can submit written comment on the DEIS up until, I believe, 10 days after the CPC hearing in February. And Sarah Krautheim is, I think, with us on the phone. I thank her very much from the Governor's Island Trust um, to, I guess, answer questions as well. I don't know if I've opened her up to something she wasn't expecting. But um, in any case, uh, we are, so the, this, this is the second, there are many environmental impact statements over many years um, on the island. But plus, I think if I'm not mistaken, the last one that we're reviewing is the secondary supplemental generic environmental impact statement that I think was released in October. Um, and so um, hopefully folks have a chance to have thought a little bit about that and um, engage in questions, uh, thoughts, concerns, and even if you haven't read it, just general environmental concerns on the island that you'd like to have addressed. Um, if there's anybody from the committee who'd like to engage on this, I see um, David Sheldon's hand up. No, 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 no. No, okay, down, whatever. Oh, well, surprisingly, I'm sorry, David, is that, that's a no, okay. So, 
Is anyone does anyone in the committee have anything that they'd like to speak about in terms of Governor's Island resiliency, sustainability, environmental impacts? Wow, surprising. Ah, so Rosa, there's our Rosa Chang. <laughs> I was going to say, I'll uh, I'll ask a question later too. But Rosa, you go first. Sorry, Wendy, I didn't see you. No worries. Hi. Um. <laughs> You're back. Good for you. <laughs> Everybody's going to be sick of me. Um, one thing I noticed at the last presentation was that the buildings were elevated um, noticeably at a higher level than um, the esplanades were. Um, and so to me, it seemed a little strange that the buildings were essentially protected from flood water, but the, but the public sort of parkland uh, areas were not. And I was wondering if um, you could clarify if that was correct. Yeah, Allison, are you still with us? I hope because you would be the right person to answer that. Um, can you, can you respond to that? Or did you already leave? Sorry, are, are you asking me? You yeah, me? it would be helpful if you had a thought about that. You want to you want to ask that? Did you hear it, or do you want Rosa to repeat it? Um, I, I would like Rosa to repeat it. I think, but um, the trust for Governors Island is on, correct? Yeah, Sarah's on. Sarah, I just message you. Uh, you were on a, uh, attendee, but I moved you over as panelists, so you can mute and unmute yourself. But yes, Sarah's with us. Oh, great! great. Thank so you both. All, all questions should really be. Um, to the Trust for Governors Island as the applicant. Um, if there's, you know, technical uh, questions or concerns and, and Sarah wants me to jump in, then I'm happy to do so, but I leave it to her. Perfect, thanks. So Sarah, so, okay. So Rosa, maybe repeat the question briefly and Sarah, welcome and thank you for taking the time to respond. Hi, Sarah. Um, so at the last presentation that you guys made, I noticed that in some of your renderings, the elevations of the, the buildings were starting at a higher elevation than the um, neighboring sort of esplanade areas that were shown in the renderings. And so it seemed like the buildings were basically being flood proofed or protected, but that the overall parkland was not. And I was wondering if that was an incorrect understanding or, or if that is in fact the case. Um, hi, Rosa, and sorry, can everyone hear me? I apologize oh, yes. for, um, Diana, I missed your chat. I, I... Yeah, um, we can hear you. So um, that uh, is not um, totally correct. And I think we, we did receive this um, question via email from Diana, but um, when West 8 designed the park, um, the majority of the new park space that was created was lifted above the floodplain. Um, there were portions of the park, um, really most notably the Esplanade, that were not elevated. And um, that was, um, there are certain areas of the park, including the um, lawn spaces that are intended to be able to withstand um, flooding um, and, and um, the development sites will um, need to incorporate resiliency measures. I think the renderings that have been shown show a range of methods. Um, there have been proposals to either elevate um, the space to create sort of this high-level esplanade. Um, we've also showed some alternative approaches such as um, elevating the buildings, um, but, but the majority of the park um, was elevated and really has been considered a model in terms of um, utilizing park spaces for um, uh, the plan for for resiliency for future flooding and um, sea level rise. And we can provide, I can follow up with, um, I know Diana requested a copy of the master plan, but a lot of those design elements are really outlined in great detail um, as part of West State's plan that was released in 2010. Um, so if there's specific questions on that, we're happy to answer and provide more information. That would be great, Sarah. I have um, just a, again on that, um, Sarah, uh, Rose and I discussed this a little bit, but um, 
in, in 2018, the DEIS had the proposed the proposal included the elevation of the development parcels and the establishment of the split level promenades as part of the actual proposal to respond to the resiliency concerns. I'm just curious why those were removed. Uh, is it just to offer more flexibility? And in that vein, it would be really helpful to see, given that seems like a, a potential likely scenario, given that it was an, a proposal only a few years ago, you know, what that really looks like and what that means in terms of the scales of these promenades, which, so that's a two part, I guess, question, but, you know, or ask. Uh, what, what's very unclear to me, and I was trying to bring up earlier in the zoning coastal uh, resiliency discussion is how these promenades go from sort of level zero, if you will, to, you know, level 15. And is the idea that the berm, let's say, in a split level, you know, to understand, are we talking about that 75 feet being cut back by the scale of the berm? So you're talking about only 50 feet, or how does that work in terms of the split level promenade? And it may not be something you want to do tonight, but if you can just get, give us a, a better grasp on that, because it looks like that's something that's likely that could happen, and it, we don't really have any information on it. And it was it was in the DEIS, as you know earlier. Yeah, that um, I'll have to get back to you on the specifics of your question. Um, but uh, the the split level promenade was a concept that that was proposed, and is something that could still be um, done as part of this proposal. I think um, uh, the different strategies around resiliency um, have been researched, kind of in great. Uh, detail for for our proposal, and we wanted to show sort of a range of strategies that could be accomplished on Governor's Island, really as a showcase for um, different resilient construction methods. But on your question around um, uh, the promenade, I'll have to get back to you um, if you don't mind sending the question to Diana. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But why in two years was it taken out of that proposal, uh, the current proposal, but it was in an earlier proposal? Is it just to show? I'm just curious why. Um, like I said, I think we wanted to show a range of methods. Um, no, you know, all of this will be subject to a future RFP. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. So um, let's see. Um, Michael Kramer. Uh, my question is about um, the construction process. Um, if my recollection is that the south end of the island is all built on landfill meaning that it's gonna be very soft and you're gonna to have to go down very deep in order to build 30 story buildings. What are you gonna do with the fill? Is that is that in the future gonna be on the seaport side and extending our shoreline? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand your question. The, the fill. So when the World Trade Center was built, which was basically built with a, with a, a bathtub, underneath because it was basically landfill. Are you going to have to build a, ba a bathtub to to build your tall buildings? And then what are the environmental effects of all the fill and and, and the, the deeper foundations that are going to be needed? How will that impact us? Um, that's another que a question that I'll have to get back to you all on. Good question, okay, thanks. Um, all right, Rosa, your hand is up again. Is that you again or good if it is? I forgot oh. to lower it. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I have to say I'm surprised at how few questions or um, concerns folks are raising, but I imagine more will come as we look over the actual EAS, EIS, um, perhaps at the next meeting. Do you, well, I, I have another question, um, which I, I, you know, I, I, I just am curious about how the proposal, um, you know, under your general purposes, one of the main goals, I think, was to promote public use of the island for water related recreational and educational activities. Um, the benefit from the unique island setting and I just was wondering how. Um, you know, the goal is being met in the current proposal. It's kind of unclear where areas have been set aside. Is, 
for recreational uses associated with this unique island setting. You know, the potential for step down areas and for fishing and boating and, and the like. And much of this was recommended in the Waterfront Alliance Maritime Plan that you know, was provided to the trust in 2019, which highlights a lot of these areas for recreational activities and stresses the need to make wedge an assured part of the development. And it just seems at this point it's critical that that gets addressed and that the infrastructure for waterfront access occur early in the development process. So I would be curious, I think it would benefit the community to know more about, um, you know, how that, that goal is being met specifically in terms of the public use for water related recre recreational. I'm sure it's all there, but it would be great to sort of highlight it um, in terms of the zoning if possible. That, that again, doesn't have to be in, <laughs> right now, but. Sure. Um, so, you know, it's something uh, increasing waterfront recreation and, and educational opportunities has, has sort of always been our goal. And I think um, thanks to the partnership that we have with many of our partners, including the Harbor School, Billion Oyster Project, um, other programming organizations like the Climate Museum, Grow NYC, and Earth Matter on the Island, um, we've been able to deliver a really, I think, successful um, range of public programming opportunities sort of related to climate and the environment on the island. Um, we are very, very much interested in expanding recreational opportunities. I think many of you know that the downtown boathouse runs um, a free kayaking program on the island. Um, we think there's a lot more that we can do. Um, and we think that the vision we've outlined as part of this proposal um, will help amplify and expand um, opportunities for that sort of work. Um, part of what we are focusing on now, sort of in tandem with the um, outreach we're doing related to the rezoning is developing um, a really robust set of goals we want to um, incorporate into the RFP. Um, so goals around public engagement, um, uh, other recreational amenities we want to see on the island. I know that um, this community board has talked a lot about some of the Waterfront Alliance's recommendations. I know that there's been interest in um, opportunities to touch and engage with the water. Um, these are all things that we can both write into future RFPs, but also um, continue to explore through um, programming, through recreational enhancements. Um, but you know, a lot of a lot of this requires um, funding, um, and you know, we're committed to expanding this stuff. But it's it's sort of as funding becomes available. Um, but we are we are happy to continue to engage with the community board on these ideas and um, and talk uh, talk about creative uh, proposals for more recreation on the island related to the waterfront. Uh, I mean, I, I would just argue that I think that it's, as I said, it's just really critical that that infrastructure gets really lodged early. And, you know, I, I don't know if there's a way to address it in zoning, but I'm wondering if that's not a, a, a good idea. Um, and, you know, was, I remember in an earlier proposal, for example, the wetlands at the south part of the island were being addressed, but now are removed um, from this proposal. It just seems like that would be a, a great thing to to remain as part of this zoning proposal and, and the like. I don't know if that's possible, but it just seems as if um, the water borne uses and recreational uses are just, um, you know, just in waiting for an RFP, I'm just not sure if that's, if that's the wisest approach, but. Yeah, no, the, the RFP is, um, goal setting is really one um, strategy for achieving that, I think. Um, you know, as, as we've shared with the community board um, in regard, you know, there is still more open space to be built on the South Island, um, including the the wetland portion of the park you mentioned. Um, that uh, is something that West State had proposed. I think most folks are familiar with Picnic Point on the island. Mm -hmm. um, there is a portion of um, the currently fenced off area adjacent to um, the Eastern Development Zone that is allocated for park space as part of our master plan. So there's actually still unbuilt park on the island. Um, 
we're excited about the wetland idea. We actually did show it in our renderings for the climate center proposal. Um, so that is certainly still on the table. Um, those portions of the master plan park were not completed due to funding. Um, uh, they were basically uh, VE'd out of the plan um, uh, uh, back when the park was being built, but we you know, are still committed to, to building them. So I think we'll want to definitely engage with the community board on, on ideas on how to use that space. But um, we're still we're still into the wetland idea and and um, excited to pursue it. But again, you know, we we not currently have the funding for that um, and, and we'll be building that public spaces. Having become that's, built. Well, that's good to hear. I'm looking forward to seeing more with that water activation plan. Yeah. And just lastly, um, you know, given this is a little bit more on environmental impacts. I, I actually read the chapter on hazardous materials. Um, uh, and I just was, I was, I was, I was struck in reading that um, since it was a, an active military base, it, it was impossible, it was possible to encounter quote unquote, unexploded ordinances, which were defined as unexploded bombs or remnants of war. Um, and that it states that there are a set of precautions currently undertaken during intrusive activities. I was just, I mean, I, I assume you have that under control, but I was kind of curious as just where you're at with that. And more specifically, is the gas station and the, um, that hazardous building out there on the south end of the island, is that gone or, and are those brownfield sites? I'm just curious about those, that, that, that whole area down there in the south end. Um, so I'll have to get back to you on some of the technical aspects of your question. Um, I will say that um, we do have an archaeologist that we work with on um, some of these issues when there's um, any construction on the island um, that's particularly come up within the historic district um, and um, the existing tenants and projects we have there, whether it's LMCC or um, the Harbor School, um, new construction has had um, some review by an archaeologist, um, which uh, to me sounds like a pretty fascinating job. Um, I believe the gas station you're referring to on the South Island, which previously was located in the Eastern Development Zone, was demolished. Um, but I will have to triple confirm that that yeah uh, the entirety of it is no longer present. Um, Are there brantled sites on the island? Um, I'll have to get back to you on that question. All right, I'm going to um, shut up now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. Oh, my okay. pleasure. Um, okay, I see Jeff Ga uh, Jeff Galloway. Um, hi, thanks. Um, I, I apologize if you've addressed this already, but I, I, I didn't hear it if you did. As, as I understand the current sort of development plans that the RFP will be based on, uh, anticipate development of somewhat in excess of 4 million uh, square feet. Um, and if I remember right, uh, previous plans showed development of a little over a million uh, square feet. So there's been a substantial increase. And as I understand it, the rationale for the increase is to uh, achieve self, self sustainability uh, of the island. Um, can you, is there anything you can share with us in terms of what numbers in terms of revenue required? in order for the island to be self-sustaining. Um, and it seems to me that the more you develop, the higher those numbers might be because there would be more infrastructure that would need to be developing. And sort of a corollary question is to what extent, um, well, it's really a commentary, is that I, I think we not like to see overdevelopment if the objective is to create something like Battery Park City, where you have these huge excesses um, of of revenue that end up going into the general fund, and it's you're really generating more revenue than you need to be self-sustaining. So, if you could just comment on the kind of the economic analysis and what kind of numbers you may be able to share with us in terms of self-sustainability. Sure. Um, so on. Um... November 9th at the land use committee, we presented um, a fairly detailed presentation that went into um, the zoning rules, um, the DEIS and um, uh, 
our path to financial self-sufficiency. So I would encourage you to review what's been presented previously. And um, to the extent that the community board has specific questions on the financial model, we're happy to, um, to dig in and, and provide those answers. But um, uh, if Diana, um, if you could point um, the uh, Jeff to the public presentation that we shared, um, I'd appreciate it. Sure, um, I'm putting the link in the chat right now. Perfect. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, and then on the question of um, previous um, density that's been studied, um, I will say that um, previous studies either related to the North Island rezoning, which happened in 2013, or the park construction, um, at that point, there was not a specific plan for development on the South Island. And um, the 1.3 million square feet number was based on um, the previous Coast Guard development. Um, this, uh, the proposed um, uh, cap on density on the South Island was developed both with financial self-sufficiency in mind um, and also to reflect um, what we see as an opportunity to create a vibrant district on the island um, to support both the climate center vision as well as um, expanded year-round use of the island. Um, you know, we have said this before, but we really want to make sure that we have the right mix of uses um, to support an island that is as exciting and vibrant in the summer as it is in the winter. Um, it, you know, we've heard a number of concerns from the community board related to um, heights, uh, bulk, and overall density. So, you know, I think would encourage you all to um, comment on that um, in the resolution. But, um, but the detailed financial model information is available on that November 9th presentation. And again, if there are specific questions on what's been provided, we're happy to answer those. Okay, thank you. I'll take a look at that. My pleasure. Sarah, would there be any time to present the 2013 that people refer to the earlier 1.625 million square feet development that was presented in only 2013 and has now come up as an alternate that the, the community is being asked to look at? Because I don't think we've ever seen that. Is there any time for that? Um, you know, I realize time is running short, but I'm just curious. So I will say helpful. that there wasn't really a proposal put forward there that was basically included as a placeholder to study um, the North Island rezoning, which um, I think a lot of folks on this um, board were were around for. But um, you know, the trust at that point did not move forward with the rezoning of the South Island for a number of reasons. One is that there was not there had been previous RFPs for the South Island development sites, and I think. Um, there was sort of a question of whether um, Guy Peck at the time um, would have a respondent manage the rezoning versus the um, versus the entity. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's really much to present other than um, what's already publicly available related to the EIS, but we're or previous studies, but we're we're happy to answer any questions around that. But you know, the previous RFP attempts did not generate um, a proposal or plan for the South Island, so that's why that number was included as a placeholder. Right. I, I'm sorry, I was a little unclear there. I meant that at this point, if I'm not mistaken, a similar plan is being presented to the community to to the city as as an alternate. Um, isn't there one that's sort of a no action plan and then there's a sort of intermediate plan that resembles these kinds of square footage that are that is in the application as an alternate? I don't, you know, the community board has never seen that. I just wonder if that's something that we might be able to arrange to see. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or am I crazy? I'm talking about the alternates that were presented in chapter 19, I think of your, of the G, of the EIS is. If you don't mind sorry. following up with an emailed question, um, I just want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, I could have it wrong. I will certainly do that. Thank you. Of course. Tammy. Tammy, did you have a, have your hand? Apologies, I'm juggling. My apologies. Yeah, no problem. Um, 
when we're looking at the EIS, is there different resiliency measures and the environmental impact being considered on the mapped parkland on the north versus the planned open space in the south? I'm sorry, Tammy, um, the existing open space on the historic district. No, in the in the North Island, you have mapped parkland, right? Sarah, on the North Island, there's mapped parkland, right? Part of the federal lands are mapped park. Um, the open space on the North Island is not mapped parkland. Um, there are 22 acres of Governor's Island that um, are designated as a national monument. Um, that includes the two historic forts on the island. Those are um, owned and operated by the National Park Service. So are the resiliency measures and the thought process and the environmental impact different for those zones versus the rest of the island? There are different, there would be different resiliency considerations um, for the North Island, mostly because the majority of it um, is not, is um, um, above the floodplain. Um, I'll have to get back to you if there's specific questions. There's, you know, we're not proposing any changes to the open space on the historic district as part of this. Um, but I could, you know, if there's specific questions that you have or concerns related to the open space on the North Island, we're happy to get back to you and look into it. We're just looking for, I'm looking for a contextuality of, you know, North, I don't want to say North versus South. Sure. But, you know, that, cause that doesn't sound right, but to understand the treatments and the considerations for both, because it is one Island. So right. looking to understand the relationship between those And feel free to get back to us. You know, that's just it's it's a good starting place to have uh, conversations on that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I, I one thing I want to point out um, is the as I think everyone um, knows the park space on the South Island was built relatively recently between um, been between 2014 and 2016. Um, and it really was designed to be sort of a cutting edge showcase of um, developing resilient landscapes. And, um, you know, we shared some of those um, strategies in our presentation. I know there have been a lot of presentations, but on November 2nd, um, it, you know, the North Island luckily um, is sort of situated um, above the, um, the area that the new park on the South Island was built on, um, as um, Michael mentioned earlier, it um, it was built. Uh, the South Island was built using fill from the construction of the Lexington Avenue subway line. So we sort of had this flat blank slate to play with. Um, and, and you're talking about the hills, right? The, yeah, the hills, but also, you know, parts of Park Phase One, like Hammock Grove, Liggett Terrace. Um, when you enter through the Liggett Archway um, uh, to first encounter the new park, um, it's it's subtle, but you'll notice that you start to kind of walk on an incline as you walk towards the hills. Right. All of that um, space was um, designed um, with the city's latest um, resiliency projections and elevated above the floodplain. So they are they are two distinct landscapes, but agree, Tammy, that it is one island and resiliency considerations have to be taken into account for everything. But um, the North Island really fared quite well during Sandy. Um, uh, a lot of it, again, is, is elevated um, higher than um, the previous South Island space. Um, but we can, I can get back to you with some more specifics on um, how we're approaching resiliency just in our day-to-day -day operations, even with the historic district. Well, it's also thank you. I appreciate that. It's also, you know, what we spend a lot of time in this committee specifically talking about the connectivity of resilience yep. measures around the tip of the island. Um, it would be absolutely without precedent. You know, we would be remiss if we didn't ask for understanding of the connectivity 
for what resiliency and climate change plans, how they overlap and integrate to be seamless around the island. I'd hate to lose one without having asked the question. Absolutely. And and how about um how about I mean I know it's it's not related, but you've got the two different docks that you you know you connect to Brooklyn and you connect to Lower Manhattan. Uh, are they um, how how do they fare when you look at resiliency? Are they going to be okay with sea level rise? Are their pilings deep enough to handle all the storms? Um, are they re are they related to to other things that you're working on, or do you feel like they're fine? You know, I mean, I don't know if that's the this is the appropriate time to bring it up or or not. No, it it is a good question. Um, uh, unfortunately, our real estate and capital team couldn't join tonight. I, I definitely want to let them answer the question around um, how we're investing in those assets. Um, obviously, it's something that the trust is continuously looking at. Um, and thank you, Pierre. Um, we really do envision um, uh, it's used being expanded and, and likely rebuilt to support um, more frequent ferry service to the island. Um, so resiliency is something that's certainly top of mind when we're thinking about future planning for um, uh, the pure infrastructure. Um, but I will get back to you on sort of the existing condition and plan. Um, so, so you need the development in part to pay for the upgrades to those areas. Is that is is that the thought process as well? Yes, absolutely. And and you're still of the mindset that that you've got to do all of this development so it can so this governor's island can support itself. Is that still the the main goal here? It is. Um, it's um, it's something that has has really always been envisioned um, for the island since the transfer, um, and and it's certainly um, something we've been talking about a lot with this community board. Um, and also, you know, our goal too is to make sure that we're um able to maintain the island as it is today but we really want to expand access year-round um we think that this is a, a huge asset for the city that um should be publicly accessible in the winter um just the same as in the summer um so th so this plan um is really also finding um what we think is an exciting vision to um to really make the island part of the everyday fabric of the city in a way that's accessible um, and and um, and uh, use um, uh, yeah. sort of in line with the the vision with the deed. Certainly, that makes sense. Do you feel like you're in co competition with the Hudson River Park since they have the same sort of mandate that they need to figure out a way to be self sustaining in terms of being able to cover their costs? Or you know, do you do you not feel like you're in competition with the Hudson River Park? I wouldn't say we're in competition. I think we share similar challenges. Um, I think that one difference I would point out with Governor's Island is we we really um, are more than a park. You know, we um, we sort of operate as a number of different agencies. You know, we run the transportation to and from the island. Um, I, I can't think of another park that is responsible for getting people to and from it um, solely. Um, we also maintain all the infrastructure. Um, we have tenants, as you all know. Um, we also have a pretty robust cultural community. So, you know, there's um, the island as, as an arts and culture destination, which I think we've shared too, is, is a huge part of our vision for the future. Um, that all, um, Costs money to maintain, and we think it's important that um, uh, we continue to support that in a robust way. Um, and then, you know, to making sure that we're able to maintain the island as a recreational resource. Um, you know, the open space today is is great, but we think that there are ways that we can be utilizing it more fully, whether it's through um, athletic field uses, more recreational activities. Um, I know we've heard ideas for. Um, more performance spaces, amphitheater, band shell, that sort of thing. Um, so we think that there's a lot more we could be doing on the island to serve the community. Thank you. Is the is this is there is the self sustaining aspect something that's in a regulation, a mandate? I, I think at the Hudson River Park Trust, that's part of their mandate, right? Is this part of a 
uh, does this exist as a document where you it has to be and will the city pull out or at a certain time or how, how does that work i mean is that just something that the trust has decided that they need to do or just don't no, understand um, that structure of that it was um it was written into the deed as part of um the negotiation between the federal government and the state and the city um, when the island was transferred um, for a dollar uh, to New York. Um, so it is it is written into the deed, which I think we've shared with the community board, but if, if helpful, I'm happy to pull that language. Um, I didn't realize that. So the deed states that the trust has to be self-sustaining, not, not that the city would have to have paid for it, but that the trust would be responsible for the that's right. Right. Okay. I didn't read that. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, okay. I see Michael Kramer has his hand raised. I'm wondering whether um, in your planning, you've considered whether the, the island could be used to defend lower Manhattan, to take some of the water, um, the, the effects of a storm away from lower Manhattan in your planning. And then alternatively, if not, Will some of the measures that you put into into place uh, direct more water to Lower Manhattan? Um, I know that the park was really designed the way the way the park was designed was meant to really be a model for how um, uh, natural landscapes can serve as um, uh, mitigation efforts. Um, I don't believe your second question is accurate, um, but but I can get back to you. Okay, just because water travels in every direction and it could be unintended consequences. Certainly how green everything is and how many plants and the hills and everything, I, it's got to help a lot. It's got to collect a ton of water compared to the way, the way it used to be. It does. It definitely um, was an improvement. Um, you know, the again, I encourage folks to look at some of the presentation material we provided previously and some of the elements of the master plan. But it is, it is very, very thoughtful um, and fascinating to look at how West State really thought through um, the planting strategy. Um, you know, combining a mix of native and native and the native adaptive plantings um, within the park. Um, the way some of the fields are meant to um, sort of absorb the water, um, the elevation of topography, um, it it really was quite thoughtful. And, and I believe we've shared this before, but the initial landfill um, was uh, to elevate the topography of the park during its construction was um, almost completed right before Sandy. Um, and when Sandy happened, all the construction equipment was moved to the newly created high ground and um, that we were able to restart construction in two days because that newly created ground um, didn't uh, really get any flooding, um, which is pretty amazing. So it, it has been tested, but I think, you know, um, it's uh, it was a very thoughtful plan and I encourage folks to read about it. Um, are there any other questions or comments to be um, addressed tonight? Anybody, Diana, do you have anything or any other attendees? I don't at this time and let's see, I don't see any other hands. All right, well, 913, I think that'll do it. Um, well, those are three highly impactful proposals on the community for our community and frankly for the city of New York. So I'm really glad that we had some more time on this and happy that we'll have even more. So again, a reminder that the resolution on this, on the zoning um, for Governor's Island will happen uh, next week at the land use meeting. Um, so I'm hopeful everyone can attend that. And in the meantime, please send all your comments and thoughts that you'd like to have included or addressed or answered to Diana at the board. Um, and thank you all very much for hanging in there as always <laughs> really appreciate it and i wish you all a good night thank you and thanks sarah thank you thank you very much yeah. to